And we have other tribal sponsors that we'd really like to thank as well. And you'll find them in your packet, but the Lummi Nation, the Puyallup Tribe, Squaxin Island Tribe, not Swanson Island, Squaxin Island, Snoqualmie Tribe, and the Squally Tribe. So we really appreciate their direct donation to this summit. Without them, too, you know, this couldn't have gone on. Um, the other thing is in your packet, I, I'm really happy to be the chair of Salmon Defense. It's a huge honor and I, I enjoy doing it, but I don't want anybody to think that I did any of this work for this meeting. Um, there is a, a special thanks to this steering group um, with Mike Graham, Deborah Lekinoff, Martha Consgard, JT Austin, Jim Peters, Glenn Gobin, Sean Yannity, Lorraine Loomis, Fran Wilshusen, Cecilia Gobin, Ken Currens, and Justin Parker. If you guys could give them a big round of applause for all the work that they did. Um, they started planning this over a year ago and have met a number of times and, and really have put a lot of work into this. And I want to talk a little bit, brag a little bit about our board. This board is uh, a great board to work with. Uh, Glenn Gobin, Chairman Sean Yannity, Lorraine Loomis, Chairman Ron Allen, Nancy Shippentower of Gaines, and President Fawn Sharp. That's a great group of people and a powerhouse in Indian country. And I always wonder, you know, why, why am I on this board? But I'm really happy to be serving with this, this great group of people. And I think I do know why I'm on this board. So I'm going to talk about that. And the reason I'm on this board is I was asked to help put it together when we were first starting out. And what, what is Salmon Defense is a question many people ask me. And my answer back is more... Why a salmon defense? A little higher? <laughs> Quieter? Up or down? Higher. Got it. Oh, they want me to ask the audience to be more quiet. I finally got it. I'm a little slow. Anyway, so what is salmon defense? I think a better question is why and salmon defense. And I remember back and my mentors included, you know, Billy Frank, of course, but Joe Delacruz, Joe Talixon, you know, Charlie Peterson, these guys, uh, Dutch Kinley, and you know, they sat around and these were some tough, tough guys. And they, they talked a lot about a lot of things, but one of the things they always said is we have to learn to beat them at their own game. And we have to learn how to use their tools against them. Now at the time, as Bill Wilkerson said, this was a very adversarial relationship at its best. Um, a good, a better term is probably war, you know. Many of us that fished and were around, you know, we can tell stories of literally being shot at, um, and Bill was hung in effigy, you know. So this is not good times in that sense. But what we wanted to do is learn how to play their games. Now I think the first thing, of course, was litigation. When, when our attorneys began to learn and other attorneys came in and we fought those wars in those ways. And we did win in the Bolt decision in case no one noticed. Um, and we're very proud of that fact. But we have continued to fight under U.S. v. Washington ever since it came out. We continue to fight under U.S. v. Washington. And, and I don't mean against each other. I, I mean actually against the state. Um, so U.S. v. Washington still lives and goes on, um, but there are other things that we have to do. Um, we, we work in legislation. You know, tribes probably have too numerous of bills and things that we do in the legislature and in the federal government to mention. We become very astute at that legislating process. We elect leaders like John McCoy to the Senate of Washington State. We need more John McCoys. Um, you're going to hear some people speak today that are running for other things, including the governorship of Idaho. So we need tribal people in those areas. We've, had, we've been very successful. So 
why salmon defense? Well, we also have been successful in other areas and other forms of legislation. We had one of the first and effective third party expenditure, um, um, I don't know how to explain that exactly, but it was how we got rid of Slade Gordon. We created a group that targeted Slade Gordon and took a very direct message about why we didn't like Slade Gordon in Spokane. And we never said we were Indians doing it. We just said he's building a gold mine and supporting people with cyanide leaching above your city. Wasn't it very nice thing to do, but it was a very deserved thing that he got from the tribes. And luckily, he lost. Um, we've done citizens initiatives. This gaming didn't come about because somebody gave it to the tribes of Washington State. We had two citizens initiatives and a consensual lawsuit to get to where we are with gaming in Washington State. Those were fights and those were complicated initiative strategy type approaches to a complex problem. So what is salmon defense then? Well, you can also say why not Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission versus salmon defense? Our mission is to educate, advocate, and litigate. It sounds similar to Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, and certainly Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission is fantastic at educating and advocating and, and helping tribes at times litigate. But there's lines, you know, the, fe the federal government funds Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, and one thing Northwest, other thing Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission is good at is not violating those lines. They're very accountable, they pass their audits, they do what they need to do, and they primarily stay on the science and education side of these arguments. So one of the things that Salmon Defense does is we do some things that the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission isn't able to do. And so we are a companion piece to the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission and the tribes. Well, there's another thing the commission is really, really good at, but it strikes fear into my heart every time I say it, and that's the need for tribal consensus. I believe in it, but I also believe it's very hard to do, and it's very difficult to do fast. And it, it would be very difficult for the commission to move on things that we could move on in salmon defense. For example, what just happened? We can have a board meeting. We may have a quorum here. We can make a call. We all know each other well enough to know that we support it. And we actually should be able to sign that document today. That's tough if you ha are a tribe or you're a tribal organization of 20 tribes. And so sometimes it's just the speed of what we can do. The other thing is, there's a lot of issues in a lot of courts and jurisdictions where salmon defense can operate in, a, in the role of a citizen. And what that means is that sometimes you may not want to put treaty rights up for everything. And there's a number of times you probably wouldn't want to put treaty rights up in a state court. You'd want to argue on the basis of the facts and the science. And so salmon defense has done it before, and we will do it again. We will argue as a citizen within probably a state court against things we don't and things we want to stop. So salmon defense provides us another tool in a much larger strategy that we can use on this fight for salmon. The last thing is, is that we all can be part of salmon defense. We can all donate, we can vol volunteer our time, we can support our tribe. We can play golf at the Salmon Defense Golf Tournament, and we can really make a difference with this group. But I think the first thing about this group is getting it out that we exist, and this is why, and that's how. So join us. Let's fight this fight. Thanks. Thank you, Bobby, for sharing that with us. <clears throat>
Before we call our next speaker, we're going to be going around and handing out a uh, piece of paper. So you can have some advanced time to read it, be thinking about it. And it's the um, paper on a call to action. And so I ask you to uh, take a look at that because at, towards the end of the meeting here, we're going to uh, elaborate on that a little bit more. And after our next speaker, we'll be calling a panel up to talk about a lot of the issues within this document. Um, but right now I want to call up uh, uh, Tim Ballou. Tim Ballou is going to be running for state senator in the 42nd district. Invite him to come up and uh, share some time. Here. Hey Glenn, thank you uh, Glenn and to the Tulalip people for hosting this event. Uh, thank you to the Salmon Defense uh, executive team for planning this and all the tribal leaders here before I start I want to acknowledge uh, the hard work that the tribal leaders provide not just for their communities but for for all of Washington and for all of the area uh, as a recovering tribal chairman I know the sacrifices it takes uh, to represent your people but also uh, the great benefits that come from taking a stand to protect our resources for future generations and uh, uh, Billy embodied that leadership and that leadership that defined the Pacific Northwest. The leaders of the Pacific Northwest have always been the Salish people and the Indian peoples of this area. The treaties that were negotiated provided for a way of life for the communities and, and you guys' work towards that uh, can't go uh, unnoticed and I appreciate the work that you put forward. Uh, also, uh, sitting here this morning, I, I didn't hear anybody give any Billy, uh, Billy-isms yet. Nobody said it's the habitat, stupid. Or I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a policy guy, I'm a, I'm a getting arrested guy. <laughs> and probably my favorite, my favorite was, God damn it. <laughs> but I think what I loved the most about Billy was his understanding that future leaders are just as vital as future salmon and protecting the salmon. As a young tribal leader, he would, not, not just me, but everybody, he would encourage everybody to contribute to your community. Do what you can. Take what, take what little time we have and make sure that our kids have something so that we can pass on this way of life to our kids. And it's that, with that commitment, that I'm putting my name forward to represent the, the 42nd district at the state senate to make sure that we have family values, harvesting, and the ability to carry on as a community. And it's something that, in my, in my opinion, we are underrepresented in those areas in our district. And I want to ask for your support, ask for all the tribal leaders so an opportunity to meet with you and your tribe uh, to get an endorsement and also. Uh, uh, resources that we're going to need to push this campaign forward. And to the students here, I see that there's a lot of youth and students here, which is a great thing. We're also going to need volunteers to hit the pavement and make sure we, we uh, get the word out. We're, we're, uh, voter enthusiasm is going to be so vital in, in this election, and we need your support more than, more than I can explain. Uh, but again, my hands go up to you for the work that you do, and I ask for your help and support to take back the 42nd. Heishka. Thank you, Tim, and thank you, leaders. And I encourage everyone to join Lummi Nation, Swinomish, in uh, fully supporting Tim Ballou. Tim Ballou and I hit the ground running in 2011. We ran for council together, and five of those last six years Tim was chairman together we did many things with our tribe our uh, state representatives state leadership fellow tribal leadership including defeating the largest coal port proposal in North America we all did that together uh, Tim Blue led the way with uh, Atlantic uh, salmon net pins, declared a state of emergency, and many other things. Uh, Portage Bay Partnership, the pollution from the river that contaminates our 
oysters and shellfish, just to name a few. And he's proven to uh, not only work for us as a people and the environment as a whole, but together with the states. And uh, many of you state representatives here know Tim personally and know that uh, uh, the work that he does is for the greater good of all. And I just encourage uh, an endorsement, support, and for the youth, today is, uh, is uh, history being made following in the footsteps of Senator McCoy, who has blazed the trail into the unknown and set the example, and Tim is carrying that on. And uh, we just encourage the youth to really witness what has taken place today. And um, thank you, Tim, for being courageous. And uh, thank you for all of you who uh, stand with him uh, to make this state a better state and have great representation throughout. Aishka. <laughs> Well, I really hope we can get behind Tim and support him in uh, his race here, um, whether that's financial or being out to hand pamphlets or whatever it might take. Um, I know it takes a lot to put yourself out there just to run for tribal government. And uh, I can't imagine what it takes to get out there and run in the public sector as a whole. Um, whether we like to admit it or not, sometimes there's a lot of prejudices that you face just walking from door to door. But uh, if the message is strong, um, the right person will get get uh, put in the position there. So I uh, wish you the best of luck there, Tim. Uh, moving on with our agenda now. Um, thank you all for your patience and for still sitting with us here throughout this day. <clears throat> but we want to call up uh, our next panel. And I'm going to introduce the moderator and then going to have him call up his panel members. So I'm going to call up Ken Kearns. Ken uh, leads the... Um, Conservation Planning Program at Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. He also acts as a scientific liaison between treaty tribes in Western Washington and the federal government and state agencies. He served as science director for the Puget Sound Partnership. He is active on many science panels and advisory groups. And he served as a, on editorial boards for North American Journal of Fisheries Management and Fisheries. So Ken. Thank you. Um, let me invite my panelists up now. I think it'll help our transition if we're all up here. So uh, Maria and Scott, Jason and Joseph, if you wouldn't mind joining me up at the front right now, um, and we can move into what's called the enlightened part of the session, but I feel like I've been enlightened a lot already, so I'm not quite sure how we got that special designation. Wandat apriu wihi shore suite, the drocha marsh hath passed to the ruta and bathed every vina in sweet liqueur, of which virtue ungendered is the tour, when the fairest ache with the sweet of breath, in spirit hath un every holt and hatha, the tondra cropus. And so begins Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales, considered one of the classic works of English literature. Um, I read it the way I think Chaucer probably would have said it about 700 years ago. We don't read that tale much anymore. Maybe, Glenn, because we don't have an oral tradition that has been so powerful in the tribal community. But regardless, it is interesting that now, just really a short time, 700 years later, we would need translators and interpreters to try to understand something that we think we know a fair amount about, which is understanding and speaking English. So my job today is to introduce four translators, different kinds of translators, 
who are people skilled in taking knowledge about salmon, different kinds of knowledge, and helping us make it useful. Before I introduce my panel, though, I, um, I do want to say a few things about the knowledge we have of salmon. Whether it's Western science or whether it's traditional ecological knowledge, it all begins with observations. So if you will bear with me a few minutes, I'm going to take you through 50 million years of observations about salmon and what we have learned with it. Our longest record of salmon, our longest record of observations is from the fossil record. Um, that's where Western science gets its creation story for salmon. And what we learned from that is how incredibly resilient and diverse a salmon can be. There are, of course, other creation stories, and they are important too, because they tell us about other aspects of salmon that the Western science does not. Regardless, almost all these creation stories begin something like this. There was a time when there were no salmon. The world was different then. In the story I'm going to tell, the world was mainly water. The continents, the way we understand them now, didn't really exist. The mountains that we know and love didn't exist. It was warm. It was so warm that there was no snow on either the North or South Pole. And the land, such as it was, was covered with tropical and subtropical forests. And it was in that environment, so different from what we think of as a salmon habitat, that the great-grandfather of all salmon appeared, Eosamo driftwoodensis, scientific name. And it actually wasn't too far from right here, just a little bit north and a little bit east of right here is where salmon started. Over time, the land began to move. North America separated from Europe and Asia. Uh, it became cooler. We started building mountains, the mountains that we see now. And with the mountains came the rivers, and with the rivers came the estuaries, and into all that there were salmon. All our species of salmon that we have today were here anywhere between 6 to 15 million years ago, before the glaciers even carved out the Puget Sound. And it was an incredibly diverse group of salmon. We had, as an example, chum salmon that only grew to be a couple inches long as adults. And they lived in fresh water their entire life. Now, if you're a salmon biologist, you won't believe me, because we think that chum salmon are the one species that has to go to the ocean to complete its life cycle. But maybe that wasn't true. And if salmon were small, just a couple inches big, they were also huge. Ancorhynchus rastrosus, which is sometimes called the saber-toothed salmon, was nine feet long, weighed four to 500 pounds. It looked a whole lot like a big, gigantic king salmon, but it had two tusks coming out of its upper jaws. Incredible diversity. That's what the, uh, that's what the fossil record tells us. The next uh, group of observations is about uh, 11,000 years old, and that's the observations of the Indian tribes and First Nations up and down the coast of salmon, where they were, what they were, what they did. All that is recorded in tribal languages, in tribal stories, in tribal artwork, and tribal songs. What that set of observations brings us is a rich sense of diversity about what salmon is about. I was taught this by a friend who I was in graduate school with, a Umatilla tribal member, who went on to get a PhD in molecular endocrinology. So he understood both of those worlds, and he said, Ken, Western science is a thread. You can take a thread and you can build a rope, but it will always be a rope. You will never have a weaving. You will never have a tapestry. To do that, you have to have threads that go the other way. So I thank him for telling me that, because I think that's what we bring when we look at the tribal knowledge about salmon. So we've gone from 50 million years to 11,000 years. And let's go to the next set of observations that we have of salmon. And those are about 130 years old. And that's the catch and landing data that we have when Western Europeans began to harvest salmon. Um, 
What that data tells us is how abundant salmon really were when Western Europeans first got here. And it also tells us how much we've lost. Recently, we were trying to calculate the, the historical abundance of steelhead in the Puget Sound. And to do that, we had to go back to the 1890 landings, catch landings of steelhead. In that time, between 400,000 to 600,000 steelhead came back to the Puget Sound each year, based on those records. What do we have now? Just a few percent. 13 to 14,000 salmon coming back to the Puget Sound every year that spread across 32 different populations. So what that information tells us is what we had, the incredible abundance of what we had, and also what we've lost. It was during that time also that Western scientists began to rediscover what tribal folks already knew, which is what kind of salmon were out there. Where did they go? What was their habitat? And we've continued to discover that. At the same time, we started hatcheries. And it's interesting that a lot of what we know about what salmon need came from trying to put salmon in hatcheries to make up from the loss of habitat and, and, and other things that had led to the demise of, of salmon. So things like what kind of water quality they need, what kind of, what's their temperature tolerance, what, is their, what kind of oxygen do they need in the water, what kind of nutrition do they need, what's their endocrine system like, that's the system that allows a salmon to, to do this remarkable thing physiologically and go back and forth between salt and fresh water, their nervous system, all that we learned from trying to raise salmon in hatcheries. And now it's really good information for moving forward with salmon recovery. The last set of observations I want to talk about are only about 35 to 40 years old. And that's the counts, the numbers of salmon that are coming back to each population in each stream, and the number of fish that those populations are producing on their way out. Perhaps it's a coincidence, or perhaps not, but we only started getting that information when the tribes became involved in fishery management. So what we've learned from that information, unfortunately, is how at risk salmon really are. That's the information that the National Marine Fisheries Service used to list Lake Ozette Sockeye, Summer Chum, Puget Sound Steelhead, Puget Sound Chinook, all under the Endangered Species Act. All likely to become endangered in, in, in the foreseeable future. And it's been two decades since the first of those listings. And how have we done? At best, salmon are just hanging on. But many populations are declining. On the coast and in the Puget Sound, many populations are declining. So when we started thinking about what a science talk would look here, we thought, should we tell you how bad it really is out there? And then we thought, no, because you're here because you already know that. That's why you're here. So we want to emphasize today something different that we've learned from salmon, uh, from all our 50 million years of observing salmon, and that is this. We know what salmon need. We know what salmon need, and what we don't know, we can find out. So nobody should leave this conference today thinking that not knowing is an excuse for not acting. We know enough to act, goddammit, as Billy would say. That's the truth. So let me begin by introducing some panelists. And my first panelist is Maria Pasqua, and she is a Macaw language teacher um, and will bring us a Macaw and kind of cultural perspective on salmon and maybe even talk to us about some language in salmon. Thank you, Maria. Okay, sure. We'll call Classita or Kuditscha Aksups, Yacht its dea. Katiksha took tip do lila pat, Chabuth do Yachquichia saksa. Ushuk shall its two at Utst Akuch Adukt dis, Awaduk Shitlap Kaid, Slibaksti edis K, Ushuk shall its Quisa at Hekda Uquache Hit Kath, Ish Dub, Zikiti Kath, Ukwe, 
ושהוא יחשב לצה תקוות שכבר אחדת שתכי סעדה דאה וכי שתי כי סך וכי אחד. דאו פוקעת דאס כאו קודת שתעת חי יחתי יש קודת שתעת חי צדה דאת שוקעת לוק נט טיילר יש חצ'ופסי אקסיס ג'סטין פארקר זכשאי אקסלח ודות וקעת שעת לתקע כנתי צמבט יחצת דיה צעודוק שעל אצלך תוקעת לי קצ'אט כקוש עד כי סע אושכו צ'יק שעת סוק טיפ סוואץ יוקו. So what I said, my name is Maria Parker Pasqua. I'm Maka from Nia Bay. I express thanks to Tulalip that we can be here in your territory. And thank you Sam and Defense for, for inviting us as we gather together with our minds. Thank you to the people from the other tribes that helped and all the speakers today. Thank you witnesses as you folks watch, listen and remember this day. I'm happy to see other Macaw here and the Macaw Tribal Council Chair Nate Tyler and my brother Justin Parker. Uh, and I wanted to start this by singing a prayer song. I want to take just this time because uh, Jim Ward, he was also a fisherman for part of his uh, lifetime, passed away. And right now in Nia Bay, they're gathering for this funeral. And so if you have lost anyone recently, like within this last year, uh, this is something we do at home because it, when somebody hurts, we all hurt. And it, uh, so I just want to take time to pray for them at home while we're uh, gathered for this. And if you have someone, you can think about them and you also can, can pray too. Wohiyo, wohiyo, oh, hey, 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 oh, hey, oh, oh, hey, oh, oh, hey, 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 oh, hey, oh, oh, hey, oh, oh, hey. Hey, yeah, hey, hey, yeah, hey, 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 oh, hey, oh, oh, hey, oh, oh, hey, hey, yeah, hey, hey, yeah, hey, hey. Sure, you may be seated. Thank you for uh, your patience. Um, but I wanted to do that because I, I know this to me is a time kind of to celebrate because look at all the people that are here for this reason. And uh, if when something else is happening at home like this, you know, it's like um, uh, it's hard to celebrate completely. But that's why I wanted to pray for that. For, for any hurts you also have, you might also have too. And um, I, one thing I noticed when I was looking through the material for this is I saw the, the words, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, but for salmon. In Macaw we say tsuwit and Chinook jargon, which all the tribes knew and all the pioneers that had to come here, they all had to learn Chinook jargon, a kwanat, not sure if I'm saying that right. I just know a little bit of Chinook jargon, but both my uh, grandpa and my great grandpa's on his side were fluent in it. So uh, I'd like to go ahead and um, get started. I have a lot of stuff here, but I wanted to uh, go ahead and start this. So I don't know where to turn it. Is there a... Oh, here it is. I found it. I have to point it that way. Oops. Well, help. Yes, oh, there we go. There go. So I like the t the title of a uh, part of this portion. Now, the part of the things that are being talked about are truth 
And then our part here with this panel has to do with en enlightening or en enlightenment. And so I was thinking about symbols because for us, uh, we do a lot of um, connection with metaphors and uh, things that you see and liken them to something in our culture. So Asikak is the daybreak, and that's when we prayed in the morning. So for any kind of endeavor, whether it was uh, fishing for salmon, cod, halibut, seal, whale, this is what we did. The, the men especially, they, they prayed and asked for success in their endeavor. So the light of each new daybreak, every day we have decisions that we make. Some of you are in uh, policy and upper levels with government, and there's things that you can do in, in every day, in one decision, in one moment of time, you can make a decision that changes things for you know who knows how long or that can affect so many people so the light of each new day break if if we center with the one above uh, and do what's the right thing do what's true and right and then a fire shining in the dark uh, that's a natural resource fire and when i think about what has happened to the salmon and think about it's been a dark time for them for a long long time a really dark time uh i would say and we're here to try to do something about that. And then the moon illuminating the night gives us light in the night and the brilliance of lightning splitting the dark, stormy sky, and even splitting the earth, the water, and sometimes stunning living creatures, even whales. And so I put this image of a thunderbird and whale and lightning serpents because the whale, or the lightning serpents are like harpoons that the thunderbird uses to hunt whale. And uh, it stuns it. And I was thinking about what we're doing. And sometimes, I mean, Billy Frank did some real stunning things, didn't he? I mean, he, he uh, put some lightning rods into different people and processes. And very extreme, but he did it because he was motivated to. He knew uh, what he had to do to make people listen. And so uh, I just wanted to uh, show those items of, that to me are natural things that make light. And we need to light up people's minds so they can see the right thing to do. And I wanted to say about language and culture, they're inseparable. And so the language conveys what our people think and value and do. I had to pit, put some macaw salmon cooking there on macaw days. And I uh, just want to read a little excerpt. In September of 1993, shortly after the native language law passed at the national level, the Macaw tribe showed their value and respect for our ancestral language by making the Macaw language the official language of the Macaw tribe via an act of resolution through our governing body, the Macaw Tribal Council. If the tribe, Macaw tribe so chooses, legal documents and business can be conducted in the Macaw language, and the Macaw tribe can exert its sovereign rights as a sovereign tribe. So these are things that uh, when we really thought about what our language means and how we can revitalize it and maintain it, it's so key, and it's key to what we're doing here today because... We had names for all of these salmon and for all our fishing equipment and for the times that we fish, the seasons of uh, availability. And I wanted to also say about Ozette, from 1970 to 1981, we had ex excavation going every summer at the Macaw, the Macaw village of Ozette. And one of the oldest art forms that are down there are the petroglyphs. If you go down the Sandpoint Trail instead of to the Ozette Village on low tide, you'll see them there. So I don't know if you can see that, but there's an image of a man kind of tilting, and he's got a spear like, like that. <laughs> I don't know if you could all see that, but like this. And he's spearing a fish. And the petroglyphs, I mean, it's hard to carve. I think it's hard to carve. But, I mean, carving rock... That's really hard, and yet they did it, and they put images on the stone, and those are very difficult to carve and date or figure exactly when those things were carved. But that's our oldest art form, and as been, what has been said before, our people put honored different animals and birds and beings and fish and um, reptiles and everything by 
putting them in our art because they were important. Every creature was important. And then one of the things that came out of Ozed is this little man. It's a, he's a bone, made out of bone, and he's inside a muscle shell. And that's a story we have. And so the Ozet uh, carbon date that site to three, three to five hundred years old. And so I heard that story when I was in elementary, when I was probably age 10 and on, I heard that story from different elders. And they were excited when this little piece was found because it proves our oral history had been intact three to five hundred years. And how long had it been going prior to, you know, this... Uh, um, archaeological excavation. It just, they were so happy to see that because they, they knew that story. And so the Ozette site was a wet site and it uh, was a complete capsule in time, uh, three to five hundred year old artifacts and stages of, all stages of manufacture. So it wasn't like an archaeology site that had people's rubbish and stuff that they threw away. And it was a wet site. They had to hose it. They didn't go in with picks and they had to take care of it in another way. And that also helped, I believe, with um, just how to excavate a wet site. So the archaeological evidence from the Macaw village, I should just grab this closer, from the Macaw village of Ozet shows a rich and thriving culture. The excavation ran in the summers of during the 1970s. 55,000 artifacts were recovered, a portion of which are displayed at the Macaw Museum at the Macaw Cultural and Research Center. Almost simultaneous to this excavation, the Macaw tribe began more active involvement in using JOM, the Johnson O'Malley a Native Education Funding, to hire tribal members in positions like education coordinator and uh, paraeducator roles, TAs, cooks, bus drivers, as well as elders and experts language teachers, carving teachers, weaving teachers, these actions all helped our people, especially our youth and cultural renewal, but also showed uh, what we had, how we lived, and added to the science and archaeological wet site excavation. And this is a whale bone chitush, that's a, a war club, and it means face splitter, hand-to-hand -hand combat. But I liked how Lloyd Colfax used to teach at the Evergreen State College, and he understood macaw, but in the first um, introductory exhibit in our museum, one of the things he said in there was uh, our war clubs were at one time used in combat, but now we need to use these war clubs against ignorance. And I think that's what the battle we fight is people not wanting to accept or maybe blaming or whatever they think uh, not knowing what the truth is. <clears throat> I can't get this thing going. Okay, Native American language, definitely a key to enlightening our minds and hearts, and it brings foundation to indigenous epistemology. The study of knowledge leads to the study of learning, which leads to better methods of teaching. The study of knowledge helps us understand our cultural differences, which helps us all get along and that's an excerpt just from looking that epistemology definition up online. Native American indigenous knowledge, um, learn it, do it, live it, be an example of it, show and pass it on to your children and grandchildren for the generations to come. So I chose these pictures because there's little kids learning how to do a paddle dance on Macaw, you know, in preparation for Macaw Days. And you can see the older group actually performing on Macaw Days, see how the paddles are all in sync and we sing canoe songs they help you keep time this is a picture of tribal journeys this is a picture of our whaling crew and so that kind of knowledge is done by example passing it on passing it on and it's um it's the what we do native american language definitely oh whoops read that I'm trying to get this ahead Macaw language has been taught in the Nia Bay school since the early 1970s we formalized our alphabet in 1978 and we continue to train and certify language teachers in our effort to restore and maintain our language preschool K through 8th and Macaw 1 2 and 3 and occasional adult classes when scheduled so this is a picture in Macaw 1 they had to do a pre-contact project to learn the past tense, you know, talking about the past, research words describing Macaw longhouses, labels included words like boards, rope ties, fish racks, dried fish support poles, etc. illustrate and share their findings. So they took, took a corner of our classroom 
and turned it into a longhouse with paper. And that orange up there is all the salmon hanging up in the rafter beams or the salmon racks. And then this is a, just another picture com, com, showing the difference between an actual realistic type salmon and our Indian art. And so this are, these are macaw names for salmon. We had every type of salmon because we fished uh, the straits, the ocean, and then in some uh, rivers and uh, streams and lakes. So tsuwit is koho, hadid, humpback, bikat, blue, blueback or sockeye, chichkawas is a chum or dog, salmon, and sawas is a king. And then in different stages, tutupkiyukt is a black mouth or young king, or satsup, also a jack or young king. Kakalawat is an old king. Lulasakt is an old sockeye. And the other ones, you can just modify them by saying uh, baby, young, or new, or old, or mature, depending on what you're talking about. Oh, whoops. Salmon parts. So this just shows the exterior. The interior parts are all general, like just what you'd say for anybody's heart or liver or intestines. But uh, this all has names for the tail, hitakli, hitakwit. Kawad is a dorsal fin, but it's also a word for a killer whale, it depend, but it depends on the context. And chipitab is, are the scales. Um, again, head, eye, and cheeks are all words you can use for any animal or person, but the word that's different is kakawad, which is the fish's nose, and it might maybe refer to the cartilage. Dagwas are gills, and hidaskabath are the arm fin, hitakwit is the stomach fin, or you can talk about both of those back fins as atlachiv, the bottom fins, the two bottom fins. So um, all of these, like I said, you can talk about them in our languages, and so not just in Macaw, but every tribe represented here, if you look into your your words and what you have, you uh, it's important to say these names, to learn these names, and breathe, breathe life into our languages. Um, the knowledge of place is also important. We have so many geographic names for usual and accustomed places, many more than English names listed in USGS maps or marine maps, not just the names of main geographic features, but places within places. So for example, a creek might have a turn in it, or it might have a dip in it, or it might have a waterfall coming down, and it might have names going all the way up the creek. Um, we have quite a number of name places on Ozet Lake. One name is Akiyiku, which means plenty or a lot. And when uh, Mark um, was our biologist, and we had still had elder speakers left in the 80s, um, they... He took us on a trip on Ozet Lake, and our elders named the places, and when they got to that creek, they said, well, this one's a kieku, lots of fish here. And that is where we now have done work. Uh, the Macaw Fisheries Department began to work on that creek to help this stock. It was natural, had pebbles in it. It was because even in the language, that's what it was called long ago before the uh, fish depleted there due to logging and poor other practices. Um, so knowledge of all our places is very important of uh, the habitat, um, not just in the rivers and lakes, but also in the ocean and uh, the sound and the straits, and knowing the time based on year, weather, and currents. And then just knowledge of salmon, where they live, what they do, how and where they travel in schools, we call that pupuay, and also what they eat, what they are like in salt water and fresh, how they taste, when they're prepared in various stages, and what our oral histories tell us about the salmon people. Those are very, very important stories and important traditions that we still do today. So uh, these are just uh, pictures of salmon that I found on the internet. I just thought they were beautiful, and uh, so they include, um, I think, coastal and Haida art as well. You might recognize some of those. Uh, knowledge and respect for others who fish. So we have all kinds of other animals and birds that eat salmon. So achpab, that means salmon eggs in our language, are, are um, achpab eaters or egg eaters, raccoons, ducks, and other birds and other small fish and people. Quick little story. This is for the ladies in here. If your husbands ever have um, 
salmon eggs and you need to ask them what they're for because my <laughs> my husband had some salmon eggs and he wanted to go fishing with them and put them in borax and mix them and make bait and when I saw them in the fridge I th they were defrosting we had frozen them and I thought oh I think he wants salmon tonight so I baked them and was proud of our you know this is what we're having for dinner tonight and he said that was my bait <laughs> so I always ask. Um, so small salmon eaters, uh, we have uh, bass, minks, otters, herons, and then old salmon eaters, bears and eagles especially. Um, and then just in general, you know, there's also hawks and ospreys, which are sea hawks, and uh, seals, sea lions, sharks, killer whales, and people. We all, we all eat the salmon. But our people studied and knew these, and we have a relationship not just with the salmon, but with all of the different creatures. Because if you're praying for help to be a successful fisherman with, with salmon, and you watch how patient the crane is when he's going to, you know, nab down at that salmon, um, you have to be the same way. And there's a thing called like Tumanuas, or uh, we call it Uktaku, but I think in Chinook, or I'm not sure if it's Chinook jargon, Tumanuas is like a spirit helper, a spirit power. All these things are really deep things, and they're uh, really important in our view of things, and why all of these are also respected. Um, but I also agree with the problem with the sea lions, and uh, we used to hunt all of those as well, and I'm sure that would keep populations down. Fishing gear. Tai Dith is a fish club, and I, I need to probably move faster, but you can see all the different types of things, and I won't read those all, but, uh, you know, from swivels to sinkers and cork lines and fish traps and weirs and fish net needles, drag nets. Uh, we have a word for gill netting on the river, gill netting on the ocean, trolling. And uh, when we went back to D.C. to view the things that were in the National Museum of the American Indian, one of the things that the person that was in charge of the, uh, the things that are in storage in the cultural resources building, he said that the macaws have the biggest collection of fish hooks um, on the North American collection of things that they had there. And as we went through and opened drawers, there was just drawers and drawers of fish hooks, all different types, you know, cod lures and halibut hooks and... Uh, salmon hooks and everything. So the other thing that I wanted to mention is that net up there. Net is called suyak and it means web. It can mean a spider's web or a net. And at the time that all the fishing, uh, the court cases for fishing were going on, was about the same time excavation was going on at Ozette. And we brought this fish uh, this um, fish net to court because some of the um, commercial fishermen or people were saying, oh, you Indians didn't use nets, and um, we learned it from, um, from them. And we got to bring this in and say, no, here's archaeological proof, you know. And Suyak is a net, and Suyak Iyak is a spider, and he is a web maker, so you respect and learn for, from all of these. Uh, this is a food preparation, and so you can um, make, there's all kinds of macaw names for all of this, cleaning, fish knife, filleting, drying the fish upside down, partial dried, partial smoke for steaming, dried fish, salmon strips, or barbecue around a fire, and success and celebration and care for future generations. This is a plate of some dried salmon, and I know there are many tribes that are involved with their uh, First salmon ceremony, and we had a ceremony for first catches as well, um, where you have an abundance. And so I just wanted to say, you know, take care of your languages, use your languages, um, breathe life into them, and uh, I think that you'll find that there's just such a wealth of knowledge. If you haven't done that already, there's such a wealth of knowledge, and that knowledge also will help with, I think, salmon recovery and respect for the salmon. Sure. That means okay. Thank you, Maria. If you have not been to the museum in Nia Bay, please go. 
it, it, for me personally, it was one of the most hopeful experiences I've ever had to go there and see what had happened there and, and also to understand that the Makahs could have lost their language, but they didn't. Just like we could lose salmon, but we're not going to. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Scott Chitwood. Scott has been a fishery manager for uh, 40 some years and um, he's seen a lot of problems come and go and I think he brings us a great message of how we use good science and good strong decision making. Scott. Thanks Ken. Thank you to the Tulalip tribes for hosting this event and the Salmon Summit Committee for organizing. Uh, they did a fantastic job. Um, so uh, I apologize a little bit for the artwork on my title slide. It was something my grandkids picked for me. And uh, it was, uh, what do you think about this? And they said, yeah, this one, this one. So uh, um, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about um, the status of our salmon. But I want to do that in a kind of a roundabout way. Uh, I want to talk about a fishery that I was involved with many years ago and when I started my career. Um, I want to connect this fishery with a plan and actions that we carried out under that plan that led to better salmon management, better salmon culture, and better working relationships with our co-managers. And then lastly, I want to suggest that we can uh, use what we learned then uh, in our effort to recover salmon now. So here's the question. How are our salmon doing? Well, uh, if you can put yourself in my shoes, I was given the somewhat unenviable task of trying to describe to a room full of salmon people how their salmon populations are doing. And I'm sure I don't really need to do that. Uh, I'm sure you are more than aware of how your salmon populations are doing. So I won't go directly to that question. Instead, I'll go to the next slide. So everyone has a salmon population that they relate to. Uh, uh, or a fishery, or a stream, or a river, or a watershed. Um, and we all have our measuring sticks. How, how do we measure status? Uh, is it abundance? Is it catch? Is it escapement? Um, there are different ways of doing that. So one measuring stick that I use often, because I was involved in this fishery, is the commercial troll fishery off the uh, coast of Washington. Uh, specifically the coho troll fishery and so measuring sticks and that so I was uh, I was a port sampler did anybody else start their career as a port sampler uh, the I don't see any hands being raised I guess I'm uh, uh, at the at one time there was a fairly um, popular way of beginning uh, one's career in fish management and that was to work for uh, the Department of Fisheries as one of their port samplers I did that in 1976 and 1977, working for the Department of Fisheries out of La Push, and I was sampling the catch from uh, the commercial and recreational fishery uh, that was uh, being uh, brought to that port, uh, either for landing or for taking home. Now, so that's my measuring stick, and literally, that's the board I was using to measure salmon to do my job as a port sampler. So in the interest of full disclosure, uh, I must let everyone know that I have just supplied you with a subliminal message. It's just below your conscious level, and if I told you what the message was, it wouldn't be subliminal anymore, so I'm not going to tell you what it was. You just have to guess that for yourself. The troll fishery off the coast of Washington has operated for over 100 years. Uh, in fact, I've heard one account that it was the non-Indians emulating the tribal trollers off of Nia Bay that really was the beginning of the troll fishery. And the troll fishery started more so in the mouth of the Columbia and in the Strait of Juan de Fuca than anywhere else. And those areas sort of were the center of the troll fishery for several decades because 
Um, the advent of uh, gasoline motor, which wasn't all that reliable, was sort of what was dependent on to operate in that fishery. Um, it, it, took, it took some of the advancements of um, the technology that was introduced during World War II to really move the fishery offshore. Improvements such as uh, relatively uh, inexpensive marine diesel engines, uh, Loran navigation um, technology, hydraulic powered girdies, uh, and then eventually better radar, radar, better radio, better sonar. That was the uh, um, uh, advent of technology that sort of moved the fishery offshore. I want to point to the four main ports where this, the uh, uh, commercial troll fishery operated out of. Uh, starting from the south is Iwaka, Westport, La Push, and Nia Bay. So here's a, here's a figure starting in the 1950s. Um, and you, you can see, I won't read everything on the graph, but the fishery again was fairly stable from the 1910s through World War II or thereabouts. There was uh, approximately um, um, there was approximately uh, 1,300 uh, vessels that participated in the fishery. These were fairly fairly significant vessels, and uh, by the 1960s, uh, the fishery had sort of expanded. Uh, there's now 2,300 vessels in the fishery, somewhere between. 30 to 50 more vessels per year since the 1950s. Again, this is catch of coho per year, just a real simple figure. And um, by the 1970s, you can see the expansion has occurred. There's now over 4,000 licenses in the fleet. And most of that expansion has been a result of the smaller boats. Uh, when I say smaller boats, I mean day boats. Um, the larger vessels have uh, really not expanded that much. Uh, in the last 10 years, but uh, they still make up the majority of the harvest. Now, I, I point to this particular point on the figure just because it was 1976, and this was the record catch year in the coho troll fishery off of Washington. And that was my first year as a 21-year-old wet behind the ears, doesn't know anything, still in school, and I thought this was just normal. I thought a million, a million three, yeah, that's... That's a big number, but about a third of those coho were landed in La Push. So well over 400,000. Our sampling rate was somewhere between 40 and 50%. So my coworker and I figured we handled somewhere between 150 and 200,000 coho that year in our attempt to look for missing fins, biosampling, et cetera. So just, just to offer some photographic evidence that I was actually there, uh, this, this is uh, pictures of uh, La, the Port of La Push in 1976 or 1977. I can't remember which year it was. Um, but the normal activity is, is indicated by the top two photographs. And then whenever the south wind would blow, the, the trollers would come in and there would be a couple of dozen people trying to offload at the same time. And so the typical troller uh, would pull up to the buyer station, start throwing their fish off onto the grading table. Uh, those fish would be graded by species, the Chinook would be graded by size, and then the, um, the fishermen would sign their uh, fish ticket, and then, then the buyer would actually own the fish, and the sampler could do their business, which was to dump those fish in a tub and look at every single one that they uh, needed to look at and move them into another tub. Um, and there's the sampling program going on. There's a pile of uh, coho there that, that have a missing adipose fin, and guess who gets to take the snouts off of those and send them into the, into the lab, and, and the rest is, is history. There was a commercial, excuse me, a charter boat fleet out of La Push, too. It was only about 10 or 12 boats, but, but it was still a, 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 a fishery that had to be sampled. So just a couple of other things to describe um, sort of uh, surrounding the, the fishery in 1976. It's important to uh, hit a couple of highlights. There were other things going on besides just record catches of coho. Uh, implementation of U.S. v. Washington was a big deal. Um, certainly there was uh, uh, a major 
a major need to do something about sharing harvest in that in that uh, short period of time after the bull decision. Um, things weren't moving as fast as some some tribes would like, obviously. Um, marine conditions seemed to be favorable for salmon production at the time. Uh, we had sea surface temperatures uh, that were running in the cool phase for almost three years straight. So it was a highly productive time of year, or uh, excuse me, a uh, couple of years for uh, salmon production off the coast of Washington. Um, uh, coincidentally, the recreational fishery just happened to be hitting record levels too. There was just shy of one million uh, coho landed in the recreational fishery that year. Uh, so yeah, just uh, uh, in the push, there might be two or three hundred boats a day, small kicker boats that would that would go out. Um, the other uh, important uh, production uh, element was the uh, warehouser uh, company was experimenting with salmon ranching and they were about halfway through their experiment they were releasing between two and four million coho smolts every year and adding to the um, to the uh, catch that was occurring off the coast <clears throat> new hatcheries were coming online um, the Quinault National Fish Hatchery in the late 60s um, Soldek uh, State Salmon Hatchery uh, in the early 70s, these were adding, uh, these are just two examples, new, new facilities that were adding uh, coho to the, uh, to the ocean catch. New management tools. Um, the one that comes immediately to mind is the invention that um, came about through the work of Keith Jefferts and Pete Bergman, uh, originally called the coded magnetic wire tag. Uh, as is depicted in the uh, images here, I threw a picture of the ventral clip up here too, just as a reminder that we were looking for all missing fins, not just the adipose fin. So ventral fin clips, pectoral fin clips were all being used at the time and we needed to, we needed to search those of search for those clips as well. <clears throat> Perhaps the most important uh, event that was going on that time of year or, or during that time was the Fishery Conservation and Management Act of 1976, which was signed by President Ford and it required regional management of, of, this, of the United States anatomist fisheries and anatomist fish runs including the troll fisheries. But we, re we really did already know that the coho fisheries had expanded to such a high degree, not just in the U.S., but on the Canadian side as well, that it, it just wasn't sustainable. And, and uh, there were efforts to really try and get the, um, the new Fishery Management Conservation Act uh, to kind of ramp those rates back down, but they, but they really couldn't move fast enough. Wild coho runs on the north coast were not meeting escapement. Um, there was very little opportunity for terminal area fisheries as a result. We were trying to figure out ways we could uh, accommodate the, the fisheries that were already in place and, and also uh, probe for what the proper escapement uh, goals or levels should be to establish the goals on the north coast. This was for, for all of the uh, major river systems, the Quileute, the Ho, the Queets, um, and to some degree the, the Quinault. So implementation of US v. Washington really wasn't going, or yeah, was, wasn't going that well. Um, and, and we were having some pretty regular con conflicts with our co-managers. Those conflicts um, between the coastal tribes and WDFW reached their peak in the early 80s and uh, Hovey Baldridge was uh, one of the results of our, our conflict, unfortunately. Um, we did get a court decision that, uh, uh, whose major finding was that each of those uh, coastal coho runs needed to be managed run by run, river system by river system. So weak stock management became the norm at that point. So real quickly, back to the coho uh, troll catch chart. I wanted to complete this picture, bring it up to the present. So here it was in the 1970s, 
record catches occurring. And in the 80s, things kind of stopped at increasing at that record pace. Uh, obviously, there were changes to fisheries as a result of the new federal laws. And um, obviously, some production uh, issues were occurring as well. And so the 90s, not, not really any better than the 80s. And then just bringing us up to the current with the coho catch off the Washington coast. And just to throw in another data series, that's the Chinook data, just for comparison purposes. So what we really needed was uh, some leadership, and we got it. Uh, leadership stepped in. And um, thank you to Billy Frank Jr. and Bill Wilkerson. Um, those two really kind of provided a, uh, call it a, a new paradigm. It's an over, overused term, but it really was a change in how we did business, not just with harvest management, but with things like stock assessment. Up to that point, we weren't even sharing escapement data. We were generating different escapements and then having competing escapement estimates. After this point, we were sharing data. We we're coming up with one escapement estimate, uh, just a completely different change in the way we operated. One of the things that we needed, uh, yeah, we've and we heard Bill talk about this uh, before. We needed to try different different ways. One of the things that we needed on the North Coast was a plan. We needed a, a Hobie Baldridge plan, and here's the team that put the plan together. Uh, all of these people were valuable uh, to its uh, development, coordination, and implementation. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have been part of this, and uh, uh, it's one of the things that I wanted to connect with today. Um, the purpose of the plan was to vary the escapement on the North Coast Coho in an attempt to discover MSH levels. Uh, we used a, a wide variety of enhancement techniques, augmentation, and supplementation. Uh, we applied all of our available resources, and I don't mean just money, I mean people, I mean equipment, uh, whatever we could find to do the job. We used a native broodstock to develop a core a group of, uh, of uh, broods so that we could develop the supplementation program. And we used a number of different techniques to try and boost uh, production so that our escapement would also be um, uh, varied in order to discover what that, what that MSH uh, level of escapement should be for each of those coastal coho populations. So three papers, uh, I would recommend three papers on this subject for those that are interested in, in the, um, the gritty details. The uh, question of how do we balance escapement needs uh, of wild uh, weak stocks with, uh, uh, with hatchery uh, objectives. Uh, the other paper is what are the appropriate coho escapement goals. These are all you know, big questions that we are trying to answer by working uh, working through this probing approach. And ultimately, um, this paper was uh, sort of a what did we learn paper. Uh, what worked, what didn't work. Uh, we had some things that, that worked quite well. Um, supplementation as a general uh, tool is simply going to replace what's there already. But if you have the kind of data that, that we need to determine whether there's full seeding in a system or not, Supplementation can provide that um, can provide that extra production to to sort of fill that void, um, particularly if if we have like a, a, a down year like we've like we've experienced recently. So in 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 a certain sense, we, we know what to do because we've done it before. Um, we know how to do it. It's just a bigger scale now. And so working together, uh, sort of reinventing the uh, co-management, um, what the term means uh, could be, uh, could be uh, productive. It was then, it could be now. One more data set that I felt was kind of interesting to add, going back to the catch figure that I had put together using the Coho uh, data set and the Chinook data set. And that's the, on the y-axis and the green dots. Can anybody take a guess at what that data series is? Population of Washington. That's you and me. So that's just kind of the, 
different directions that we're going. And it's kind of important to point something like that out, I think. But in my estimation, salmon are resilient. That was the message we heard earlier. Uh, I'd like to repeat that. With given half a chance, uh, these salmon can bounce back. And um, this was the other image that my grandkids liked a lot. They really liked this. They've got a couple of these posters that they like to, uh, that they like to put up on their wall. And uh, uh, I just think it's a terrific message and a, and a really nice piece of art. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Scott. Our next speaker is Jason Griffin. He's a uh, salmon recovery biologist with the Stillaguamish tribe. And um, he's going to, to share some of the experiences about what they've learned um, doing the hard work of recovering and protecting habitat in the Stillaguamish River. I will say, I do want to say though, that Jason represents a lot of other people. Uh, the tribes and state, but the tribes have a lot of people like Jason on the ground helping do this work, and it's a tremendous capability that we have. So, Jason. And, and Ken didn't mean that as an insult, any of you out there, so <laughs> don't take it that way. Okay, thank you for inviting me to speak here today. It's uh, quite a privilege. It's also a bit intimidating. Um, whole careers have been devoted to this topic. Uh, my office is full of journal articles, reports, books on the status of, of salmon habitat, none of which were written by me. Um, but nevertheless, you'll hear my take on the habitat issue, uh, hopefully in a way that causes you to think a little differently about the state of the habitat today and where we could perhaps move it into the future. And while the main points I'll be sharing today aren't original, um, Anything that I get wrong, you should squarely blame me for and not Chairman Yannity over there. So it's my fault. Okay, Let's see if I can do this. Okay, so for me, thinking about the state of the habitat starts with the state of the habitat forming processes. What are the ingredients that create and sustain salmon habitat? And if we're talking about the state of the habitat, the state of it compared to what? What is the measuring stick that Scott talked about? And I think having an idea of the reference condition at least helps me put the current state of the habitat into perspective. So I'll start with how habitat forming processes functioned historically, and I'm not gonna go back as far as Ken did. I'm gonna go back more like a couple hundred years, 150 years, um, and compare that to how they do currently. For the most part, there's exceptions to pretty much everything I'll say. And then I'll share a bit about how they function currently. Oh, and also the recent habitat story. And then I'll close the presentation. This is on a little bit different path that perhaps we could take. And before I get too far into this, I wanna point out that the habitat story around Western Washington is pretty nuanced. And so every watershed's unique and I, but I think most of the major themes I'm going to share today are represented in the majority of the areas that you all work. And I'll be referring to the Stillaguamish quite a bit because that's where I've worked for the last 18 years. But I'll bring in some other examples too. Okay, so habitat forming processes. What do I mean by that? I'm going to really simplify things and distill it down and basically just talk about three main things. I'm going to talk about wood. Beaver and water. I think for the high level discussion today, I think this mostly covers the processes that create and sustain salmon habitat in the freshwater and the near shore. Um, but I think it's important to mention a few things that I won't be talking a lot about. One is um, water quality and quantity, um, which are getting a lot of attention and rightly so. They're absolutely critical for fish and everything that I'll discuss today depends on having sufficient quantity and quality of water. Also, I won't be talking a lot about climate change, but the processes that I'm going to discuss are really important in a changing climate uh, to buffer salmon populations from their effects. And also, I think it goes without saying, um, we talked a bit about 
about culverts and, and blockages that you need to get the salmon up to the habitat. So I'm not going to talk about that, but they need to have access. Whoa. Okay, wood. It's important to understand that uh, most of our rivers today are, are pretty much devoid of wood. But this, well, at least compared to how they used to be. But this uh, wasn't always the case. Um, this photo is of a log jam on the Quinault, but we have good historical evidence that these sorts of jams were quite common around the area rivers, especially on the Stiligwamish. Well, certainly on Stiligwamish and a lot of other rivers too. Um, some even fully spanned the channel, um, which means they went all the way across. They provided all sorts of nooks and crannies for juvenile fish to hide and to feed, for adult fish to rest on their way upstream. And they're really good at diffusing energy and spreading sediment and water across the floodplain. And there's a mountain of data showing how beneficial these large log jams are for fish and their prey. And they're also quite resilient. For a time, they protect the forested islands behind them, allowing the trees to reach a size where they'll be stable when they fall in and not get washed to sea right away. But eventually the jams decompose or they break apart and that allows the river to knock down the mature trees behind. Um, these log jams don't allow a river to stay in one spot. They cause movement which over time adds wood and spawning gravels to the system and that movement keeps that floodplain wood cycle going. But rivers with log jams, abundant log jams especially, they take up a lot of space, and that space tends to move around. Okay, beaver. In the tributaries and the margins of the major floodplains, beaver used to be abundant, and anyone who's dealt with them can attest to their determination and their productivity, not to mention their, their work ethic. If left alone, they can totally change the drainage in a valley. Juvenile salmon, especially coho, have evolved to exploit the low energy uh, wetlands that they create. And there's a lot of data on, on the dramatically higher growth rates um, these juvenile salmon experience if they spend time in beaver ponds like this one up in British Columbia. And contrary to the rumors, these dams typically aren't significant barriers to salmon. The fish usually find a way since the dams are dynamic and they're porous. Culverts, if they're built in a culvert, that's a different story. Um, these beaver maintained wetlands also help to recharge aquifers and they slowly release water during the summer. But um, you can see from the photo that beaver dams and the wetlands behind them take up a lot of space. So if you mix the wood together with beaver and add a bunch of water, you often get a dynamic river like in this photo, um, one that interacts with this floodplain forest with expansive wetlands scattered throughout. This configuration is good at spreading energy and sediment from high flows across a wide area and not focusing it into the stream bed where salmon put their eggs. It also provides a lot of rearing area and spawning area, not to mention the processes that sustain that habitat. And there's some interesting research um, that folks at NOAA and others are working on that's coming out that shows that these complex floodplains limit the variability in smolt production. And that complexity seems to offer resilience in the face of poor climactic conditions. But you can see these rivers take up a lot of space when they're operating like that. So where the rivers met the Salish Sea, a well-developed network of tidal channels usually spread across large areas. Uh, this photo of the tidal wetlands at the mouth of the South Fork of the Skagit um, kind of shows what those wetlands historically looked like across large parts of the Salish Sea. Twice a day, the tides would pulse in and out, bringing prey into the channels where the juvenile salmon, especially Chinook, will feed for weeks or a month, gaining valuable size before they venture offshore. Some of the highest growth rates in percentage terms occur during this estuary residency. But due to their low gradients, these tidal wetlands sprawl across the landscape and they take up quite a bit of space. So beyond the rivers, the marine shorelands of the Salish Sea and the Washington coast were once dynamic environments as well, where waves and tides work together to erode the trees and sediment and move them along the shorelines. You can see this happening in this oblique photo of the south end of Whidbey Island. The sands and the gravels eroded off these bluffs helped to create and sustain forage fish habitats, which are important fish for adult salmon, not to mention the right conditions for underwater vegetation where juvenile salmon are able to use, cover, use for cover as they work their way out to the ocean. But these processes uh, mean that the shoreline is changing and often moving landward. And they take up, the shoreline like that takes up quite a bit of space as well.
So I hope I've given you a glimpse into habitat forming processes and briefly how those processes create and sustain salmon habitat. But about 150 years ago, as white settlers started to pour into Washington, they quickly realized that these processes were a major impediment to harvesting timber, to building uh, infrastructure in towns in the floodplains. Um, the rivers, for one thing, were filled with snags and log jams, which made it difficult to get the timber to the mills and the sternwheelers upstream. So the Department of War, which is a great name for department, um, set to remedy this by deploying a succession of snag boats to clear the Salish Sea and the rivers of navigation hazards. Once they cleared the jams and snags, they took down thousands more trees from the banks that could have fallen in. And when they were done, nearly all the log jams and had been removed along with the raw materials to make new ones. And this is a battle we're still fighting. The Department of War has been replaced by the Army Corps of Engineers, but I still see trees being cleared on a regular schedule from the banks of the Stiligwamish and wood pulled from the channel. And this, if there's anyone here from the Corps, it's not personal. I just, I'm just pointing that out. <laughs> okay, it is personal, I guess. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> So clearing the rivers may open up the interior valleys to the white settlers and the loggers and they didn't waste any time in getting the timber off the floodplains and the hills. In the span of about 50 years, they removed most all the timber from the anatomous zone when this is the area that salmon spawn and rear. Usually it's lowlands, uh, less than a couple thousand feet. Um, in the floodplains, homesteads sprung up to farm the rich soils. And for the most part, this is something we're, we're still maintaining. We're still keeping those floodplains clear of timber which severely limits the supply of wood to the channel. It's a little bit better story up in the hills um, through the TFW agreement um, that has better forest practices. But in the floodplains, it's uh, predominantly still kept clear. Okay. Oh, this is harder than it looks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but a lot of those rich soils were underwater. The beaver, they were everywhere, and they reproduced like crazy, but they had nice fur. So we shot and trapped them, and the Stilgwamish just meant about 2,000 acres, or 90% of the beaver-maintained wetlands were drained to make way for the farms and the infrastructure we see today. And that's a battle we're still fighting, because beaver, if you've ever had to deal with them, are they're pretty hard to permanently kill. They come back. And the tides, if we, they would just go out and stay out, we could farm those rich soils better. So we pushed the tides back, and pretty effectively too. And the Stiligwamish this cut off about 85% of the historic wetlands, uh, tidal marshes, from juvenile salmon. If you think back to that photo from the Skagit, many of the farms in this photo uh, were built on marshes like that. You can still see hints of the tidal channels that used to be there. And we're spending a lot of money each year to keep the tides out and the drainage and levee infrastructure maintained, not to mention bailing out or rescuing landowners during floods. But even after all that work, the rivers wouldn't stay in one spot. They kept wanting to move and take that rich soil to the sea, so we nailed the rivers down, usually pushing them to the valley walls. In the Stiligwamish, dozens of miles of rock and levees were added, reducing the channel area by about a third, and that uh, enter, that armoring focused the flood energy into the riverbed, causing it to downcut six to eight feet over the past 50 years, disconnecting the river from its floodplain and often blasting fish out of the gravel during floods. And this is a battle we're still fighting as well. We're still armoring our rivers and we're still maintaining that armoring. Well, I think you're getting the picture now. Um, the marine shoreline's pretty similar, the story. Tides and waves held back to make way for our homes and businesses and other infrastructure. And uh, erosion kept in check uh, with a lot of armory. So that armory, limit, like in the freshwater, limits the flow of wood and sediment and often reflects energy back seaward, which impacts the intertidal habitats. So despite 150 years of fighting against these habitat forming processes, you can still see their fingerprints on the landscape. In this uh, relative relief image of the Stiligwamish main stem, lighter colors are lower relative to the river and darker colors are higher. And you can see on the margins of the floodplain where big uh, beaver maintained wetlands were, you can see 
how the river used to migrate um, across the floodplain. You can see where log jams likely split, split the flow into multiple channels. Um, you can see that there was once a lot of water and a lot of habitat, but it took up quite a bit of space. If you look at that same extent today in an aerial photo, you'll see that Stilgamish is similar to many other systems with a significantly modified floodplain. The processes that created this floodplain and the associated habitats are no longer operating, or they're operating on a very, very small scale. This transformation, I think, has been so complete that most are unaware of the magnitude of what was lost. But more importantly, I get the sense that many have forgotten how these systems used to function when they supported abundant, resilient, and productive salmon runs. So to illustrate, I put this together based on archival sources and some recent work done by the tribes in NOAA documenting status and trends and habitat. It's not perfect, it's more stylistic, but I think it generally tells the story in the Stillaguamish, and it's probably similar to the story of other systems around western Washington. And I included to put the recent trends in salmon habitat loss into a broader perspective. We actually have pretty good data from about the mid-1980s onward, which generally shows a few percent loss of habitat. It depends on the exact type of habitat, but in general, a few percent in recent decades. So while the current regulatory climate keeps things from accelerating downward, we're still losing ground, but it's pretty slowly compared to the rates in the distant past. But going to hell slowly is still going to hell. So we've reduced freshwater and estuary and marine habitats to a shadow of their former selves. Now there's no buffer during the poor marine or freshwater condition cycles that we're currently stuck in. And so we're in this state of low abundance and productivity for salmon and all that depend on them. And we're spending significant money each year to keep it in that state as well. Mainly because it was once salmon habitat is now valuable for other things. And because most land uses aren't willing or able to cede any ground to the processes that create and sustain salmon habitat. So that's all pretty depressing, I think. <laughs> and probably pretty expected at this forum, but I'm not going to end there, so don't worry. Um, I think many of you are wondering at this point, is there any way to significantly change the state of the habitat? Is there anything to be done about where many of these watersheds are headed? And I'll share with you an approach uh, that we've been working on for about, about the past decade or so in Stillaguamish, and I think it could be modified to work in other areas and other types of systems in uh, shoreline systems as well. Okay, secure. We're working with willing landowners to purchase river adjacent parcels, estuary adjacent parcels as well. And we're working to link a corridor from the mountains to the sea, which is much wider than your typical buffer. And then protect. We're putting deed restrictions on that land to prevent future development in perpetuity, which provides a certainty on the time scale of an old growth tree. I thought I had to figure it out where I pointed this thing. Restore. We're removing and setting back infrastructure, we're planting trees, and we're allowing for those habitat forming processes to resume. And we're keeping at it. It's going to take a long time, probably many decades. Sometimes you have to wait a long time for people to sell or die. And you've got to protect what habitat <laughs> you have in the interim. So you've got to stop the slow loss. And you need the right ingredients, and that will vary depending on your location. But if you have them together, I think you can get back to resilient habitat. And we're nowhere finished in the Stillaguamish, uh, but we have purchased about a little over a thousand acres in the last 10 years. And we're working in the interim to build, to uh, remove infrastructure, write more grants for more acquisitions, and planting a lot of trees. But the, could that approach even work? Is that even reasonable? Is that is that something that could happen? And I think so, at least in some of the watersheds that aren't completely urbanized. Um, salmon habitats can be restored if you mix the right ingredients back together, and we have evidence of this. Uh, take this section of the Lower Nisqually. Um, like most of our rivers, its floodplain was cleared in the late 1800s and early 1900s, but rather than convert it to uh, 
a big kind of ag complex or a city or, or something like that. It was left alone. You can see there's a few bits of development, but they're pu pushed to the edges of the floodplain. Given the habitat forming processes, the space and the trees time to grow. And while this floodplain forest is mostly less than 100 years old, you can still see the habitat forming processes are at work. If you look closely between the two images, you can see places where the channel has changed in those 18 years. You can see in the top image, it's mapped out where the log jams are in that um, section of the river. And you can see that the fingerprints of some of those processes I talked about. Here's another example. This is the Skokomish estuary. And like most, it was, um, the tides were pushed out about 70 years ago to make way for agriculture, which eliminated a large area of tidal wetlands that were used to use by salmon. If you fast forward to today, over the past 10 years of Skokomish tribe, the Mason Conservation District and Tacoma Power have worked together diligently to remove the infrastructure, giving the river and the tides the space to resume the processes that used to work on this land to create and sustain habitat. And I think it's over a thousand acres of tidal wetland restoration. That's really impressive. To echo what Scott said and what others have said, I think what we know about the abundant salmon and salmon habitat of treaty times, it had bounced back after being covered by thousands of feet of ice. And I'm somewhat optimistic that if we give salmon back the right ingredients, actually I'm, I'm optimistic if we give them the right ingredients. I'm somewhat optimistic that we can actually come together and do that. We've got to give them enough space, enough time, and I think they can bounce back again. So I'm probably over time. <laughs> yep, time's up. I, I didn't look at Pegan for that reason. Um, I'll finish with a couple quotes from Billy, and I won't, I won't read them because I'm out of time. But I'm going to summarize that they speak to the time needed, the space needed, and the diverse interests that need to work together if we are to change the state of the habitat. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Jason. Our next uh, speaker who is going to bring us home is uh, Joseph Pavel. Um, I first met him when he was at the North Western Fisheries Commission and he was managing our division that has our biometricians and modelers and statisticians in it. He was wearing a t-shirt that said, quantitative services, we make numbers count. So, but I know in addition to that, that um, Joseph can speak to what it takes to make hard decisions as a, as a leader in the Skokomish community and, and the great work that's happened in the Skokomish. And he knows, he knows what backbone means. So, Joseph. Thank you, Ken. Well, I think just about everybody up here has uh, stolen a little bit of my thunder. Thanks for the uh, Skokomish estuary. Uh, uh, so I know we're running way behind time, so Peck, and I'm just going to roll right into the policy and action panel, and we won't be needing you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, so we're here to talk about science and inspiration. And as our great leader, Billy Frank Jr., used to say, he used to bless all of us at every meeting. He'd stand up there and thank and praise all our scientists. And I'm here to thank and praise all our scientists too. Thank all of you for being here. You know, we talk about inspired and enlightened and igniting. You know, I think, uh, you know, we're inspired by the truth. You know, and science is the truth and the truth is science. And our Indian people have always been scientists. You know, we're lacking in the one thing, and that's the written record. You know, you've heard a little bit from uh, Maria about the language and how you can trace some of the origins and the interrelationships of those words and patterns, and, and, and it tells some of the research and the science that went into that. Uh, some of these animals, these trees, for instance, like the alder tree, you know, after the grounds are disturbed, you know, through some sort of natural catastrophe. In the past, it was a natural catastrophe. But they had the job of tying the soils together until the other tree peoples could establish themselves. So they were short-lived. And there's shade-tolerant species that could grow up under them. 
our hemlocks and our cedars. And then there's a higher elevation species, our firs and our um, you know, yellow cedars. So each of these animals had a role in our um, environment. And we had uh, the art of, of, of practicing science over the, from the dawn of time, not, not from time immemorial. Time immemorial sees, means from the time of the written word, basically, as I understand it. But from, from the dawn of time, from the dawn of our existence, our people, and uh, I think one of the um, um, definitions of science, the art of science, is to observe, to record, and interpret, and replicate. So, like I said, maybe we don't have the record. It's it's recorded in our in our legends and our traditions and in our languages and in our culture. And we have we have knowledge. And we've heard Charles Wilkerson mention the development of our science programs as a requirement of the U.S. v. Washington, the Bolt decision. And we know that. We had science before that. We had knowledge. But we had to interpret and, and rewrite that into the Western mode. So we learned how to do that. You know, we knew things. We knew about the ocean migration of these salmon. We have legends and stories that tell us about the home of these salmon people when they leave the rivers and go to the ocean. How their homes lay in a great arc about the north, under the northern waters. How the pigs are the closest because they only live, travel two years. And how the chum are the farthest away because they come home the latest and they leave the earliest. And we knew these things. And we knew, the, like I said, we knew about the role of the trees on the landscape. And all the different species, the interrelationship, what it takes to uh, foster these foods and these medicines that nourish our mind, body, and soul that we're so grateful and thankful for. Praising and thanking our Creator for gifting us these things. The gift of beauty, sustainable, perpetual. It's got to be smart, do what we call wise use. And we need to carry that message. And we need to keep carrying it. I'm on a mission, restoration, saving our people, thinking for our future generations, standing here representing the same seventh generation for the people that signed the treaties and thanking them for the wisdom that they exercised by preserving those in our treaty rights. We would still have those rights. They cannot be taken away from us, but it's recorded. And we have it in law, in the law books. And our science, our science programs are founded on those law findings. Our allocation, getting our cat share. We soon realized that that was not enough. You know, getting up to our 50% cat share. Meanwhile, state scientists looking down their nose at us. Manipulating the numbers. Thought we weren't smart enough to catch on to them. But we did. We learned that game fast. They started in 76. I came on board in 82, and the tribes were already rapidly advancing at that time, making, you know, I, I, I assumed a position that was taken because the, the commissioners at that time recognized hey, we need to get into this environmental and this habitat game. So one of our commissioned scientists became our environmental specialist. And I got a, was able to um, come on board to backfill that vacancy. We knew it was a numbers game, an analytical game. Went out and hired some of the best quantitative scientists that you could find. You know, Mike Hinton, Ken Newman, Jim Scott. All these guys, Bob Heyman, well, Lorraine stole him away from another tribe, so he was already up. But we were on board. We learned our game real fast. It's a numbers game. 
And we got the scientists to back it up. You know, like I said, Mike Hinton, world renowned. And last I heard, he was heading up the International Tropical Tuna Commission. Ken Newman moved on. He's a high powered professor at some exclusive uh, uh, university in Scotland. You know, these are some high powered, some well known people. And all of and all those young scientists that came on board with the tribes, so many of them still with us. And so many of them so qualified and so expert and so committed. And that's what we are. I'm committed. We're all committed. You know, we gotta we gotta practice our management. And our management is protection, maintenance, restoration. Enhancement and mitigation. So we got to protect ourselves from any more backsliding. We got to maintain what we got. We got to make sure that there's adequate safeguards in place. We got to exercise our opportunity for restoration. A lot of that landscape out there can stand some restoration. We got to use our enhancement. And when we got some mitigation, well, I'm not ready to do a triage on anything on any habitat yet, but there are some that it's going to be exceedingly difficult. We're probably talking millennia before we can recover some of those. So we need to make up the difference somehow. So that's our mitigation. We're using our hatcheries. We mentioned the Skokomish River. Here's somebody I haven't bad mouthed yet today. Fur, city of Tacoma. City of Tacoma is our partner in the watershed. 33 years we took it to them, slapping them about the face. They just blew us off, appealing to our trustees. They just peek out the door at us. You know, money, guns, and lawyers. Our science is our guns. The Skokomish tribe gathered what feeble resources we could, did what science we could, till we could finally slip something under the door that they will look at it and listen to us. That we needed their help, and we had a cause, and we had a just reason to pursue the bringing the city of Tacoma to the table, to even talk about doing the right thing in the operation of those facilities. Science got us there before our lawyers did, before our trustees got us there. We took the cattle prod to them guys. We went into the belly of the beast and we lit them on fire. Is that enough? We want more? <laughs> Go. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I um I don't think we probably have time for questions because our we're off schedule, but. Glenn, uh, I guess you're you're up, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, for the panel to present and hear these talks. So, again, thanking our panel for uh, their contribution, their knowledge through the years of how things have. Uh, uh, changed or evolved as we've uh, reached to where we are today. Again, we got a huge, a huge uh, obstacle to overcome to get back to where we need to be. But we can't lose focus. We got to stay committed to the passion. And I often think about Billy and all the obstacles that uh, he faced in his life. And whatever an obstacle got in front of him, he found a way around it. He found a way to come at it from a different direction. 
And I think that's some of the messaging that's coming out here. We need to find a way to come at this, restoring this habitat from different directions or whatever direction we need to, using the knowledge that we have of the past, the lessons of the mistakes that have been made, and the technology of today, and the knowledge that we've gained through all of this to continue to uh, make improvements the best that we can. And uh, stay focused on that. Not the daunting task, but stay focused on that. We're going to achieve some positive change. I um, want to call up our next uh, panel. I want to ask Justin uh, Parker to come up. Justin's going to uh, has a panel that he's going to lead, and so Justin is the, of course, executive director of Northwest Indian Fish Commission. Uh, I think he kind of grew up partly there for a number of years but uh, brings a lot of experience and a lot of history um, in his journey. So, Justin. Okay. So, I, I'm going to call everybody up here. Uh, Paulette Jordan, Dennis McLaren. Um, oh, where'd Senator McCoy go? Oh, there he comes. And we also have, um, I, I, I did a Omaha on you, Glenn, here, so we do have another panel member here. I got JT Austin that I asked last night to participate on this panel. Um, you know, we, we'll have to do a little catch-up, so I'm just, I'm just going to skip past anything I was going to say to kind of open it up and, and kick it over to these guys who you really want to hear from. Um, and then I'll, I'll kind of close it out from, from there. Um, we do have... Um, Paulette is a little bit on a time crunch as she has to fly out uh, this evening, so we got to get her to SeaTac. So I'll start out with Paulette and bring her up here. But before I do that, just real quickly, um, the science panel, thank you for um, you know what you presented. I know that some of the, some of the uh, numbers are and, and the graphs and everything is, is was pretty troubling. Um, I, I do appreciate Joe Joe for hitting. The ignite button there on the end there. I think that was that was really important, and that I think that got everybody going. I don't think we need our caffeine for the afternoon, so hopefully that that got people a little fired up, and then we can you, you take this and do something with it. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what we want to do. I go back to uh, Tim Blue, who was here earlier. I don't know if he's still in the house, but one of the things that uh, he has been mentioning over over the past few years is going back to the 1980s, and you know you see a lot of the the charts there, what what um, Scott Chitwood provided from around 76 time frame, and then I look at the 80s, the heyday of the the salmon fisheries of the 80s, and that's that's the the uh, era decade that I grew up uh, fishing, and then from the time I was nine years old fishing on my dad's boat, um, you know one of the, one of my memories is is just being our way of life of, of who we are as as uh, macaw fishermen, and and that was my early childhood memories fishing from the time I was nine. Um, I, I remember back in the day um, when we were out on the ocean trolling, we were doing some uh, trip, uh, trip fishery, so at, at ice we were out there for, for a few days um, uh, salmon fishing. And, and I, you know, I was, just, I was probably 10, might have been going on 11 at this point in time. And so you know, I was just a, a little guy, well, not much littler. Um, but anyway, my, my dad had another bull puller that fished with him year-round. And so um, when I came on board in the summertime, I, you know, being back then, he didn't know any ch child labor laws, or at least if there were, my dad didn't, didn't apply that. So I remember the, the one time that we were uh, anchored up, I think we're down in father and son, and, and they're back there cleaning in the, in the back, and I was still icing fish, and it must have been around 10 o'clock at night, and, you know, we'd been up since 4.30 in the morning or whatever it was, and um, my dad's sitting there yelling, and, and there's no response, no response. So he, he runs up there thinking something, something happened to me, and he looks down in there. So over the ice, we have the, the, the sheets, the covers, that, that ice, the insulation. And so I'm just sprawled out over the ice, and I'm, I'm just out. I'm, I'm sleeping on the ice, basically, is what I was doing. And so, and the reason why I tell that story is I think it's important to, to, to get back to where we, we need to with our salmon. Um, you know, the, the governor and then JT is going to highlight some of this with the executive order that the governor rolled out last, that last Wednesday on the recovery or, or southern resident killer whale recovery efforts. 
Um, of course, from our standpoint, it's going to be about, about our treaties, and you've heard a lot of that so far. Um, but ultimately, no matter what the tool is in the toolbox, you know, we want to get back to salmon recovery, and we want to be able to be a, provide uh, for our communities and what, what we're able to fix from a salmon recovery standpoint not only is going to be impactful for our, our tribal communities, but our, our uh, Washington citizens and even the broader Pacific um, region as a whole. So uh, with that said, uh, I'd like to first introduce um, Paulette Jordan. Uh, she comes uh, by the way of Idaho. Um, she uh, is a graduate of the University of Washington. Um, not, not too long after she graduated from University of Washington, she was elected to her own tribal council, Coeur d'Alene tribe, one of the youngest, or if not the youngest member of the, uh, uh, in, in their history. And then ultimately she went on to, to be in the state legislature, Idaho state legislature. And now she stepped aside and she's making a run for the governor of Idaho. And so with that said, our next governor of Idaho, Paulette Jordan. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that good invitation. And, you know, in fact, I really want to speak more to just the fact that we're all here to celebrate Uncle Billy Frank. I just want to share a good story because when I was a young kid and really technically a kid, it was in college, freshman, I came across Uncle Billy Frank and he was one of the first elders to reach out to me and just say, you need to be in this meeting. I want you to come by, sit down, take a listen. We need your voice. This was Uncle Billy Frank, who like many in our communities, our elders who reach down to young people are showing us leadership. I've experienced this with Senator McCoy, just the same. This is the empowerment that is given to young people and how we build community. This is how we fight for salmon recovery in every single position that we need more of, especially when it comes to making change in this country. You have to vote. You have to get the right people in office. You have to have the people that we want, like ourselves, in these decision-making positions. So that's the reason why I'm running for governor, but the reason why I'm here is simply to celebrate Uncle Billy Frank because he was one who was very passionate about these issues, and thank goodness he was pressing these concerns of the people forward into Congress, into the White House, created this commission, and now we see his legacy carried on through his children, his son, and his daughter and uh, the entire community by and large, because we're all relatives of his. I come here as a niece to Billy Frank. This is an honorable position that I consider myself to be in. And so I thank you all just for allowing me to be here just to say as much, because as a two-term representative, I've always kept his voice in mind, which is much like my own grandmother's, Lucy Covington. And you have to carry that voice to ensure that people understand what it means to be indigenous and then to be in elected office. It's a high position to hold, but that means holding it with utmost integrity. And that's all of us. And Uncle Billy Frank, he would always say, have that integrity every single step of the way. Of course, he would have a, a little bit of greater language. It's kind of like a pirate. I love the way he talked. <laughs> I get that way a little bit in the business rooms, but I, I try to watch myself. But I carry myself that way now in Idaho. And as a representative, one of the issues that I foresaw and uh, having experienced uh, sitting on the Resources and Conservation Committee was the factions and all the, the divisions, essentially, from the politics and how people uh, play out our resources for their own selfish gain. And in Idaho, this is where we're going to come across uh, you know, some barriers when it comes to the four Snake River dams, when it comes down to the Columbia Treaty. We have to fight for these treaties, but again, those treaties will not happen or be sustained if we do not have the right decision makers in these positions. And I'm telling you right now in Idaho, because this is a multiple state agreement, including Canada and including Alaska, because all of these regions, this entire region is being impacted. The frustration is that we have allowed these people to maintain these roles in office and we're going to continue fighting them on a daily basis. And hopefully for not, uh, not for not, because you think of the people that are there, and I continue to think of Uncle Billy Frank and how hard he worked, and I don't want any of his efforts to go to the wayside. I want to ensure that his legacy continues. So my message today is simply, while we know we have all these concerns, we still have uh, a lot of them that are at the forefront. In Idaho, what we face are the challenges between the agricultural community 
and the environmental community who are strongly in favor of protecting our water resources and our salmon recovery. And it's all connected. However, if we cannot find a viable solution forward, we're not going to have a solution that's best for everyone. And that includes our priority, which is Mother Earth itself. So Mother Earth needs to be foremost, number one priority in this world. But that doesn't happen if people don't see that there's opportunities for jobs and opportunity for uh, growth in our economy. And that's the, the perspective that I've sort of been able to build on looking across the table and trying to find a solution so that we can continue to go forward with the voices of the indigenous peoples and the voices of our land and our wildlife. So that's the perspective I want to bring to everyone today because honestly these are challenges we're going to continue to face and being realistic I know that when we go forward we have to understand that it comes down to the decision makers. So I'm hoping that everybody here either steps up to run for office or and makes sure that our community votes. Uh, I love to have these conversations and I appreciate the uh, scientific perspective uh, but I'm bringing to you the political perspective because I want to make sure that we can change and make significant impacts long term because we need sustainability but you need these voices at the forefront and if that doesn't happen none of this changes. So I hope you all are with me. I know it's the afternoon. <laughs> So I'm going to continue to fight, but I, I want to bring this to you because there are elections going on right now, and uh, I want to make sure that people understand how important this is and how dire the need is for us to be a more powerful voice when we band together, more powerful when we turn out at these polls, because it, this is what it comes down to, because every time I get reelected, I don't see my same peers in these rooms, and there are, therefore I'm fighting against the river. And I'm fighting against these people who don't want to see the renewal of the Columbia River Treaty. They don't want to see recovery of salmon. In fact, they don't even care about our salmon. And Idaho is the place where we actually host these salmon where they come in and then they grow and they go back out to the ocean. They stem from our state. And if most of those people don't care about salmon recovery, and this is where it starts, then we're going to continue having these conversations, but it'll be in a different perspective. It'll be more as a more of a sad story, and one that we cannot recover. And I don't want to get there. So we we are just in a dire position right now, and this is the like I said the conversation that I want to make sure that you're all aware of because when I left that room, in this hearing space, uh, it was frustrating, because I'm one of the few, and in fact I'm the only Indigenous voice in my entire state from the administration to local county to governor that's fighting for the indigenous rights, the indigenous perspective for Mother Earth and natural resources, especially for salmon recovery. But if you're one, I'm definitely not going to stop fighting. <laughs> We're going to make sure that we win, but we need all of us. We're all in one room right now, so I'm sharing this because I want us all to band together, whether it's for Idaho or Washington, Oregon, Alaska. We're fighting for the entire country. But let's get there. We gotta wake up. So I, I'm not gonna preach to anyone tonight. I, I think that uh, ultimately, if I can walk out of this room, I just want to make sure to have this general understanding that we're all in this together, that we know where we are, we stand, uh, where they are at in each state. I think Oregon's doing great. Washington's coming along. Uh, Idaho is where we need to really fight back. Uh, but again, I'm one of many, uh, or I should say, one in a handful of, of many, and uh, that's the frustration for me. I'm up against many industries who, who don't see salmon recovery as an issue. They already think we spend too much money on these studies and these developments, and they don't care about water protection. They, in fact, eliminated some water standards through our Department of Environmental Quality, and so when we start reducing regulations, we start seeing more problems. But they never consider the other populations that have high fish intake, which are our tribal communities. So they're not thinking about us, and we're not even at the back of the bus. We're not even in, in these conversations. So how do we fix that? 
we run for office, we get in those rooms, we be a voice. And right now I can tell you that's exactly why I'm running for governor. So help me out. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for standing for Uncle Billy Frank and his legacy. And thank you for supporting the family. I want to thank uh, Willie and his beautiful wife, Pagan, for doing this and uh, having me out here. And I certainly hope to see this become a reflection of who we are as a people, but also in its successes continue on down the road because we do have a lot at stake. And when it comes down to salmon, people have to know that it is the heart of our entire ecosystem. It needs to be protected. It has to do with water quality, air quality, soil conservation, all of that. And our health and our children's health, this is absolutely the heart of our future, and we need to protect it. So thank you. Liam Lynch. Thank you, Paulette. Um, well, our next speaker, I'll just going to cut to the chase. I'm just going to jump right into introductions. Um, I told, promised Peg we'd make up time on this panel since we ran a little bit over on the previous one in lunchtime. So Dennis McLaren, uh, he comes from Cascadia uh, Law Group. He previously served in the Obama administration as the EPA Region 10 Administrator uh, for the, the, the Northwest uh, states and obviously our, our tribes. Um, he's, he's currently serves uh, as well as the Leadership Council the, the, for the Puget Sound Partnership. Um, one of the things that he was tasked with um, during his tenure was uh, he was the regional co-chair in, in the federal response to our Treaty Rights at Risk uh, initiative that we rolled out as we as in the 20 Western Washington Treaty Tribes rolled out in July of 2011 and I know Dennis is going to cover a little bit about that but um, anyway Dennis McLaren. Thank you, Justin. I had a few slides that uh, I had as well, so hopefully we can get those up. But uh, I just want to say it, it's a, a real honor to be here. Uh, this, uh, um, you know, Billy is in the room with us today. Uh, I think all of you know that. Uh, his voice, you know, rings in my ears and, you know, it's it's in my soul now from all the times that uh, Billy would would enter the room and, and uh, he would come up to you and he'd, he'd say, God damn it, Dennis. And he'd give you that bear hug and he'd say, Jesus Christ. And uh, he'd, you know, he'd set the tone uh, for action and for moving ahead. And, and uh, so, uh, you know, I have to say that the work that I did with, uh, with Billy and the tribal leaders and, and the fish commission uh, during the seven years that I was at EPA region 10 was uh, some of the most inspiring and rewarding and, and productive work that I've ever done in, in a pretty long career. And uh, there's, you know, there's so much more work to do, but we really did make progress together. And, and I want to talk a little bit today about uh, some of the progress we made, some of the alignment that, uh, that there is, uh, and, uh, you know, working on the right things, uh, choosing your battles and choosing you know, your forums in different political times. And uh, I think now, you know, Billy saw that there was great alignment at the federal level during the Obama administration. He was friends with the president. Uh, you know, he could walk up to the president and give the president that bear hug. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, that's a pretty rare ability to uh, be able to connect with people from at, at all levels. Uh, but Billy saw that alignment during the Obama administration and the op opportunity and the Treaty Rights at Risk initiative was, was that opportunity. Now I think there's a real opportunity with alignment at the state level. You've got a federal government that has a lot of career staff that are still very committed to the work that uh, we've all done together and you need to keep working with those career staff but at the political level in DC it's pretty chaotic and it's not the time to be um, thinking that you're going to get a lot of victories like you did during the Obama administration with, with this current uh, uh, group that's, that's at the presidential level. But there is good alignment at the state. You've got people like Hillary Franz here as the state lands commissioner. You've got a governor that's willing to put executive orders forward. You've got uh, Maya Bellin uh, at the uh, at, uh, Department of Ecology. And uh, so uh, pushing forward with the battles that we've won, uh, keeping the institutions in place that we were able to uh, pull together and, and put in place uh, is some of what, what I'm going to talk about today. But, uh, you know, um, the progress that we made during the time 
uh, of the Obama administration. I'm trying to get this thing to move. Oh, there we go, too far. Okay, so, uh, you know, um, during the time that, that uh, I was at uh, EPA, I had some great partners. Uh, Will Stell, who's been in the room today, Will, stand up, uh, you know, wave at the crowd. Will at NOAA was, uh, we, were, we were partners in crime in making progress on treaty rights at risk. Uh, we were assigned, along with Royleen Rides at the door, by the White House to, to lead the response to the white paper that Billy and, and the, the Northwest Indian Fishery Commission and, and the tribal leaders put forward. And uh, we took that very, very seriously. But I will tell you, I had always been uh, a state or a local or a regional official and moving things in the federal government. Uh, I can't tell you how challenging it is to make decisions there, to move things, to push things forward and get policy changes in it. It takes an administration time to get moving and to get rolling. And so the last year of that administration, we did, you know, 10 or 20 different things that, that got put into place. And now the battle is keep those things in place, preserve those institutions. And when you get the next friendly federal administration, things are ready to move and move uh, more quickly in that regard. But, uh, you know, I can tell you when you try and make tough decisions, uh, like the water quality standards in Washington State, uh, the fish consumption rate-based water quality standards. You've got people uh, going around you to Washington, D.C. You've got uh, people going to your congressional delegation, to your leadership in D.C., uh, trying to put forth their narrative uh, and their story. And Billy was incredibly effective in countering all of that and giving us the ability to tell the stories to our leadership in D.C. and, and move things forward like the water quality standards. And you know, we now have uh, the best water quality standard for human health and, uh, and toxics in, in the nation. And the next phase is Maya Bellin uh, taking that and implementing it and enforcing it. And I had a conversation with Maya last week where uh, she has turned the corner on believing that that is a real opportunity for the state of Washington to move forward with the implementation of that. And that's, you know, that was a hard fought victory uh, one that we had to press very, very hard on, but uh, things are aligned there, and and uh, that's huge progress. And that wouldn't have happened without Billy and the tribal leaders uh, putting a huge campaign together on that, uh, showing people, you know, what uh, the current water quality standard meant in terms of how much people fish could eat safely a day, less than a little tiny bit on a Ritz cracker. Uh, so, um, thanks for you know that hard work, and thanks uh, for making those points very, very powerfully that uh, change was needed. And that, that rings in my head as well. Uh, Billy would, in almost every meeting that I was in, say, we need change. We need real change. We need, you know, if, if we just do the status quo, nothing's going to change. So we need real change and we need our trustees to lead in that change. And, and I think we took on that challenge uh, and uh, you know, the, the, the tribal people who have lived here, you know, generation after generation, uh, as Billy said, you're not going anywhere. You're going to be here. Uh, and you need to keep that pressure on. You need to keep that fight going, but you need to choose where you're going to win. And right now, I think the state is where you're going to win. I think you need to continue to work with the federal trustees at the career level and press uh, forward on, on, on those issues as well. Uh, but uh, again, let's let's focus a little bit on uh, a couple of things that I was asked to talk about uh, today. You know, what are the key concerns? We've heard this from a lot of folks uh, all day long, but uh, continued growth, uh, the population growth in this state is is continuing on an upward climb. You know, much more rapidly than any of us uh, thought was going to be the case, and that's not stopping anytime soon. Growth can be good, but it challenges us in terms of habitat and, and in terms of water quality and in terms of uh, recovery of the ecosystem. So we've got to figure out ways to deal with that growth and deal with it responsibly. And I do see some positive trends in that regard where tribes are working with their local governments and with their state agencies on, on things like critical areas ordinances and uh, softening uh, shoreline uh, treatments instead of shoreline armoring. And so 
Uh, that's the kind of work that needs to continue as we grow. We really need to be able to deal with that growth in a way that does not lose more habitat and, in fact, uh, enhances our habitat as we grow. Uh, climate change, you know, this is a really big worry for me because, uh, I, you know, I see uh, fish moving farther north and our climate regimes changing. And uh, uh, not only do we have uh, water quality concerns, now we have temperature concerns and we have stream flow concerns and we have uh, uh, to deal with climate change that's, uh, that's uh, creating that additional stress. So we've got to get serious about that. So tribes need to be out there and I'm really pleased to see that tribes are part of the initiative effort, the partnering on the current climate change initiative that, that is uh, gonna go out and hopefully be on the ballot uh, this fall. Tribes are strong participants in that. Tribes will get money from that. Tribes uh, need to be out getting the voters out for that as well because we need to address climate change. And uh, I'm really pleased to see that tribes are taking a leadership role on that. Of course, stormwater and urban runoff, uh, uh, that's also uh, related to growth, but it, it also means that we've got to retrofit uh, the existing infrastructure that's out there. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's an expensive thing to do, but we've got to go back into our cities and we've got to get the stormwater controlled. And I am pleased to see on the political level that the stormwater permit that Ecology now is, is moving forward with has, has actually made progress. There's been a big political pushback on that over the years, but that's moving forward now. And it's one thing to get new development to deal with their stormwater, but it's another to get our existing development to deal with stormwater and the toxins that are associated with that. Uh, the ocean, we need to understand more about what's going on in the ocean and why fish are not coming back and why fish are coming back smaller. Uh, our scientists need to help us on that, but that's, you know, that's an area of concern. Uh, one that really uh, bothers me a lot is the lack of uh, political will and the lack of public concern. A lot of people seem to feel that, you know, as long as the view out their window is fine of the sound, everything is fine. But we know it's not fine. We know that uh, we've got serious problems. Uh, we know the salmon aren't returning. So we need to get that political will and, and you need to be part of that. Uh, you know, I, I think tribal people have been the leaders on this and have gotten this for forever but we need to get it at a higher level. And I'm very encouraged to see people running for office uh, because that's how real change can occur as well at the decision-making level. So uh, good on you guys for uh, stepping up and, and running for office. Um, we all need to figure out messages that better resonate with, uh, with the public on this. Uh, you know, the governor going out with the executive order on orcas, uh, uh, you know, I've heard a little bit of grumbling about it's really about the salmon and it's really about the, the, the treaties and the tribes, but uh, we need to find things that move people and the orcas are iconic. And if that moves people, I'm all for that. And you know, getting the governor's alignment around that, I think is, is a very, very positive thing. But uh, uh, you know, figuring out the messages that do work has been a concern. And, and uh, hopefully this next wave, it will drive some more public concern. Uh, what gives me hope? Uh, well, you know, there's a lot of folks, we've heard a lot about uh, tribal scientists and, and tribal people and the work that you've done, but there are a lot of other folks working on this as well. And, uh, you know, even though political times are rough right now at uh, the elected official level, uh, in terms of the presidential administration, you have a lot of folks uh, who I know I worked with for the last seven years uh, and I continue to work with now on the leadership council that are committed to, to moving this work forward. So hang in there, stay in those boring meetings, spend the time, you know, they're, they're, it looks like progress is slow, but there is progress. So keep that up. Um, there's a lot happening. I'm gonna show a couple of quick maps on uh, some of the projects that are out there, but there's a lot happening on habitat restoration, uh, good work like floodplains by design, We've got eight riparian corridor uh, projects that are being funded that are moving forward to the Department of Ecology has federal funds for. Uh, the governor's directly engaged uh, with the orca recovery, uh, which I know uh, JT is gonna talk about. Uh, there's uh, a commitment to bold actions, uh, the action agenda, uh, and, and the Salmon Recovery Council and the Tribal Management Council move forward the bold actions. 
Uh, I see that as a really important step in terms of the next action agenda for the Puget Sound Partnership. So keep up that good work. Uh, that wouldn't have happened without the Tribal Management Council pushing that forward. Uh, but it needs to actually result in bold actions happening. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we formalized a lot of really good policies during the Obama administration. Uh, those are going to go a little bit on the back burner. Uh, you know, we, we did things like, uh, uh, you know, there was a, a natural resources uh, subcommittee of the White House Council on Native American Affairs. I checked last week. There still is a White House Council on Native American Affairs. It hasn't had a meeting. Uh, and there is an executive director uh, in the White House for the White House Council on Native American Affairs. Uh, but, uh, you know, this may be the time to make sure that those institutional changes that we made stay there, stick there. You may not see a lot of positive action out of them, but the next time a new administration comes in, if those institutional pieces are still there with CEQ and with the White House, uh, you can make uh, things happen more quickly because the, the points of entry are in place. So um, here's, here's a map that I wanted to show that, again, gives me hope. Uh, this is um, showing you where uh, $200 million and over 750 activities are being funded around Puget Sound. Uh, and this doesn't include the Columbia River or the coastal areas. There's more going on there. I will say that there needs to be 10 times this much money going into this to, to really be effective. But this shows in every watershed all around Puget Sound that activities are happening, projects are happening. They're everything from uh, habitat restoration to public education to developing local ordinances uh, that are more protective. So things are moving. We just need 10 times as much uh, of this happening, and that takes the political will that I was talking about. The next one is uh, from the Puget Sound Recovery Atlas, and this shows over 1,700 activities with over $900 million in investments that are going on out there. So when I hear people say, nothing's happening, we're not doing anything, that's not right. We are doing things. We're just not doing enough. And uh, you know, when I listened to, to Billy and Billy's voice, uh, he said, you know, if it takes 500 years, uh, we're going to be there and we're going to continue to fight that fight. Well, it takes time to see some of these things bear fruit and, and to, uh, to show and demonstrate success. But when you have successes, that builds more political will because people actually see that it can make a difference. So tell your stories, point out your successes. Uh, I wanted to also acknowledge a couple of other people in the room. Uh, Jim Woods, who was my senior tribal policy advisor when I was at EPA for seven years, uh, is now with Department of Fish and Wildlife. So uh, Jim, Jim helped me make good decisions during the time that I was at EPA, and I'm sure he's helping Department of Fish and Wildlife make good decisions uh, going forward from a tribal perspective as well. Uh, Martha Kongsgaard has been here all the day to day, and Martha was chair of the leadership council at the partnership uh, when I was at EPA, and uh, we met regularly uh, on how to move things forward as well. And uh, I wanted to acknowledge her leadership. I've actually filled her vacant seat on the leadership council, uh, so uh, uh, I'm fortunate to be able to be in that position as well. So uh, another thing that uh, hasn't had a high level of visibility, and it's because it happened in the waning days of the uh, Obama administration was the federal action plan. Uh, there is, believe it or not, a really good federal action plan that is being funded and has uh, good things happening. Uh, Will uh, would speak in my ear frequently and say, you know, we've got this covert case and the state of Washington uh, has not stepped up. They are now stepping up and doing more, which is good. Unfortunately, the attorney generals made a bad decision to take the appeal to the Supreme Court, but the state agencies, in fact, are uh, remedying culverts. But uh, Will would whisper in my ear and say, we better get our federal culverts taken care of if we're beating on the state to get their culverts taken care of. So we used EPA funding to fund uh, USGS to go out and do an inventory. We funded the Forest Service to remove culverts. There are now uh, really uh, thousands of acres of habitat that have been opened up by federal culverts being replaced in the lowland areas. There are still 
more to be done in terms of forest roads to be uh, rehabbed that have erosion and so on. Uh, but the federal action plan is aligned with the Puget Sound Partnership's action agenda. It's got funding that's flowing into it. It needs more funding, but really good things are happening on that, and it is aligned and coordinated with the state agencies as well. So, so some good things came out in those waning days of the Obama administration that, that have energized the federal career staff to continue to do that work. And there was a memorandum of agreement signed amongst all these federal agencies uh, one of the things that I'm particularly proud of is we got a treaty rights policy adopted by Gina McCarthy and the EPA. And that treaty rights policy then, uh, Sally Jewell liked to compete with uh, Gina McCarthy. They, they like to compete with each other. So pretty soon after we adopted our treaty rights policy, Interior adopted a treaty rights policy. And then a number of other federal agencies adopted a treaty rights policy as well. So. Uh, at the right times, that policy, those policies are in place and can be used uh, with your federal trustees. So, uh, and, and I want to also say that uh, using your legal uh, rights in, in terms of uh, when you go to, uh, to court, Billy was very smart about that. He, he picked culverts because that was a winner. Uh, you couldn't have gotten a better set of facts than that. Uh, and I've seen tribes be very judicious about when they use treaty rights in a litigation context, but you need to use your treaty rights uh, on a daily basis and educate people about that. That was one of the great awakenings I had as an EPA regional administrator. Billy and, and others uh, took the time to educate me and bring me along, help me understand uh, the importance of treaty rights, the force and power of treaty rights, and we made huge progress together. So. Um, very last slide here, and I'll wrap up if I can get to it, is uh, the bottom line. Others have said this today. We know what needs to be done. Uh, tribal people need to continue to tell your stories. Uh, they're very powerful. They're inspirational. Uh, they show how meaningful uh, the change that Billy called for really is and, and uh, why it's important to continue this work. Uh, be relentless. Stay positive. Stay engaged. Uh, I can't say that enough. I, I see uh, tribal staff sometimes get disheartened and disengaged. You need to stay engaged. You are the reason good things happen. Your engagement is really important. You're a powerful force and you need to use that power. And uh, listen to Billy's voice. This is your place. Uh, tribes will always be here. Water quality is life uh, for more than salmon. And the work that you're doing is for everyone's benefit, not just for tribal benefit. So um, bring the public and the political will along with you. Run for office when you can. This is really important work, and I've been proud to be a part of it and, and really honored to be asked to come here and speak today. So thank you all. Thank you, Dennis. Um, our next speaker, Senator John McCoy. Um, most of you are familiar with him as we're up in his homeland here. So thank you, uh, Tulalip Tribes, for hosting. Again, I know it's been, it can't be said enough and really appreciate, you know, what you've done to put on this, uh, help put on this event, make it successful. But uh, John, he represents um, Everett, Marysville, and, and Tulalip. That's uh, the, the communities and the neighborhoods that are in his uh, district here in Snohomish County. Um, he was first elected to the State House of Representatives back in 2003, and then he was appointed to the Senate in November of uh, 2013. Um, he also serves as chair of the Senate Democratic Caucus. Uh, he serves on the Natural Resources Committee, the Ag, Water, and uh, Trade and Economic Development Committee, and as well as the Rules Committee. Uh, so John, John's a busy man down here in, in Olympia and, and doing what he can for not only his district, but for the entire state of Washington. Um, before he went into, into the state legislative work, though, he actually was um, a, in, had a, a big influence on, on what the surrounding area is turned out to be, is the Quilcita Village. So he was instrumental in the development of the Quilcita Village. Um, he advanced the position of general manager um, of Quilcita in 2000 before he made his run for the state legislature. So. With that, Senator John McCoy.
Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you, and it's uh, good to see some of my cohorts are here with us. Um, and over here, Cindy. So, um, I, I want to welcome you to Tulela um, and uh, uh, our beautiful facility here. Um, you know, this facility, Quosita Village, um, getting going into my storytelling mode, uh, began in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Because we have on record in storytelling that our elders at that time knew that something was going to happen in the northeast corner of the reservation. They didn't know what. But they knew something was big was going to happen, and so they reserved this area. And they, but they did say, and here's the punchline, that it was going to be one big trading post. So how'd Tulalip do? <laughs> That's a story. Uh, that story was told me to when I first came home in the spring of 94. And I bought into that story, and I've just been proud to been able to implement their dream. So that's what happens when you buy into a dream. And Billy had a dream. Our ancestors had these dreams. We just need to buy into them and implement them because they're already there. The roadmaps are already there because they've done it before. All we got to do is continue to do it. And it was mentioned earlier that if we don't study our history, we'll continue to be, make mistakes. So why do that? So, um, legislation that I've gotten passed, um, that uh, in regards to ed education, um, in the uh, spring of 2003, my first session, uh, it was a very long session, a tough one, and um, and so here in May, uh, there was a uh, Indian education meeting, state Indian education meeting happening. And I didn't have anything to do that day in the legislature because the budget negotiators were fighting and I wasn't on any of the budget committees. So I went out to the Indian education meeting and um, I got a tasking at that meeting. And ever since then, every, whenever we have a meeting, a large meeting like this, I always get some sort of tasking. So, and, but out of that meeting was that uh, Denny Hurtado, he was chairman of the Skokomish, and he said they wanted tribal history and culture, Washington State tribal history and culture taught in the common schools. So I went back and I, and I uh, had a bill created um, and it was already too late for that session but I dropped the bill anyway to get the conversation going and then we had to work on it in 2004 and then we finally got it passed in 2005. Well, um, it wasn't mandatory. It was encouraged to do this. Well, in 2013, Muckleshoot came to me and said, time to make it mandatory. So in 2013, we made it mandatory. And now it's, it's really moving along. Um, not as fast as we want, but it's moving. And um, on Saturday, I was over in Spokane and uh, Western or Eastern Washington tribe educators, 
they were doing a best practices conference. And I was really impressed with what they're doing over there um, in delivering tribal history and culture to um, the schools over there. So I'm feeling really encouraged. Um, and that was another thing Billy always told us, educate, educate, and educate. Never stop educating. If we want our things to be sustainable, then we have to educate. Well, um, I was successful in getting other bills passed on education, which are uh, creation of tribal compact schools in this last session, but I'm waiting for the governor to sign 6474, <laughs> JT. Um, it would be nice if he signs it Wednesday when I'm down there for the college bed. <laughs> but anyway, is what 6474 does. It allows tribes, again, to have their own schools. They, they get the, the state dollars that they would have gotten if their child had gone to the regular schools. And, but the tribe can con controls the curriculum and how it's taught. And last night I was talking to Cecilia Goldman and I asked her, I said, what, what are you doing at the Fish Commission right now? So she told me, and I said, well, when you're done writing that paper up, give it to an educator to make curriculum, and that would be a science project. So we have the technical expertise to do these things. We just need to do it. So by doing that, we're continuing our education of our ways to our kids. Because unfortunately, the common schools of Washington right now, and I've said it time and time again, it's about assimilation and institutionalized racism. And the only way we can break that is by creating our own schools and educating our kids the way they should be. So, um, so that's what we can do to honor Billy and his ways in telling us what we needed to do. And so we need to continue that. So it's great to see these young students in and out and about um, through all this. Um, and to continue a theme of Paulette Jordan and myself is that, yes, we need more Indians in the legislature. With our population numbers of Washington State, there should be two state senators and four House of Reps. Now you got me. So we're short. We got Tim Blue running. Um, from Lummi now, that's great. Uh, Chris Roberts of uh, Shoreline, who is a Choctaw, he's gonna be running for the state house. So we have bits and pieces, but we need more. But we need more Washington State natives to run. So that's my plea, educate the young and select a few while well, they need to self-select for those to uh, run for office. So that's the map. The map's there. All we got to do is implement the map. Okay? So it's great to see you all. Enjoy yourself here at Tulalip and uh, in the facility. Um, because it was put together for all the right reasons. And uh, <coughs> let's honor Billy and keep this work going. Thank you.
Thank you, Senator. Um, switching over to, um, we covered a couple folks from the state ledge, one from Idaho, one from Washington. Uh, political appointee in the Obama administration gave us a little perspective from, from the, the regional standpoint. Um, now we're, this is the, the Omaha that I, my Peyton man in uh, Audible that I called last night and I'm, I've added JT Austin. Um, so she's uh, in the governor's executive team, um, natural resources. Uh, she was uh, recruited from the, to the governor's office from the, actually the Republican caucus in 2013. Um, going over to a Democratic administration. So I think that says a lot about JT being able to work on both sides of the aisle and how, how we, as, as Billy always says, we'll always work on both sides of the aisle. Whoever wants to work with us, we're going to work with them. And then and so from, from a tribal standpoint, it doesn't, doesn't matter, you know, as long as you are issues and our, uh, we align up on, on the same pathway that we're trying to accomplish, whatever the issue of the day may be. Uh, so JT, she's actually... Uh, previously worked in the conflict resolution in the post-war Bosnia through international or uh, Amnesty International. Uh, she also uh, was part of the as a uh, team of investigators in the Defenders Association, otherwise known as the uh, Public Defender of King County. And she previously was the uh, assistant director in the Masters of Environmental Studies at the Evergreen State College. Um, so, with that, J.T. Austin. Good afternoon. I have the pleasure of letting you know I'm the last panelist, so um, and I'm not a real friend of microphones. Um, so I'm super honored and humbled, of course, to be here with you today with Billy Frank Jr.'s spirit, um, to stand with all of you, all of you who are left this afternoon. Um, and those that were here earlier, and to honor the salmon. And uh, for the, those of you who don't know me, I am the governor's uh, senior policy advisor on natural resources. So I um, have had the great privilege to work with tribes on all natural resources issues, um, including North of Falcon, water, ocean policy, salmon recovery, and forest health. I was not uh, brought up in the oral tradition, so I do look at my notes. Um, so that is one thing that I wish that I, I had been brought up with. Um, today I am here. The governor uh, was unable to come, so you have me. Um, I want to thank Pew, uh, Tulalip for uh, hosting this important event. I'd like to thank Pegan, staff and volunteers, and hopefully next year we can make this international. Um, and thank you, Justin, for asking me to speak last night. Um, uh, as far as inspired, I did want to say that I had a, I was blessed with a very short time with um, getting to know Billy Frank Jr. And I would say that without getting too uh, corny in some ways, uh, that time with him absolutely changed my mind, my heart, and the trajectory of my life. Um, and uh, who else inspires me? Willie. Uh, Willie's journey and his future um, inspires me. Ed Johnstone, who um, is Quinault, has taken the time and patience to walk me through history um, around fisheries management. President Sharp and her passions around family and climate change. All of the tribal and state folks who have worked on North of Falcon, I had the pleasure of going last year. Uh, you amaze me. You um, beyond inspire me. Um, and uh, folks at DFW who I work very closely with, uh, I would say I'm going to call out Ron Warren and Jeff Davis. They inspire me and support me in doing this very hard work. Um, I was going to talk about a number of things, but I want to make it make it short since we're at the last of our program. As you all know, the governor is committed, heart, soul, and mind, and body to uh, working on climate change. Um, he has legislation, and we're going to continue next year and see if we can get something in place. I did want to spend a little time on co-management because this is such an important subject that the governor's office needs to reinforce at every opportunity. Uh, Washington is the smallest geographically of the eight most western states with the second largest 
population, yet we have one of the most diverse sets of fish and wildlife portfolios of any of them. Managing the natural resources in Washington isn't easy, even under the most straightforward set of jurisdictions and authorities. The salmon resources that originate in our state migrate and are subject to interceptions by Canadian and Alaskan fisheries. The rapid growth and economic prosperity has posed significant threats to the habits, to the habitats uh, that our fish and wildlife resources depend upon. Co-management is not easy for the state or the tribes. Managing when there are overlapping authorities and jurisdictions of multiple governmental entities never is. However, in the case of salmon recovery, it gives us our collective strength. Successful co-management is an absolute necessity if we are going to have sustainable fish and wildlife resources in our future. And those of us that are responsible for maintaining and enhancing co-management owe it to our children and their children to make it work. We, the state and the tribes, have many challenges that lie ahead of us. Near term, very near term in fact, the renegotiation of the Pacific Salmon Treaty. Uh, U.S. v. Oregon, uh, challenges associated with the Endangered Species Act, protecting essential habitat, long-term restoring habitat and the impacts of climate change, and ocean acidification. Meeting these and other challenges demand a strong co-management relationship between the state and tribes. This is an area, as many of us know, needs work. We must move forward reinforcing our shared values of conservation, our shared value of respect and strive for collaboration and co coordination. We must check our egos at the door and get the work done. I was going to hit the habitat short list that uh, the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission through Chairwoman uh, Lorraine Loomis brought forth to the gov governor for consideration and we are long overdue ad addressing and responding to that short list. I was going to go into great detail today, instead I'm going to put it in a formal response. But what I will say is that we have given, it, um, given each ask a lot of consideration. Um, the request alone indicates that we are not doing a good job. It's an indication of a lack of effectiveness and a loss, loss of confidence in our co-management relationships. So that makes us double down. After looking at failures, sometimes that's what uh, creates change. So we acknowledge these issues and these uh, concerns, and we are ready to step up in ways that we have not thus far. Riparian protection, toxics reduction, and the co-manager relationships are other pieces that we are going to talk about in our formal response along with permit tracking and accountability. We do believe that there are places to go forward and go forward together on all of these issues. That leads me to ORCA. As you all have heard, the governor's executive order on a southern resident killer whale recovery was rolled out, I believe, last week. I haven't had a day off for a while, so I'm pretty sure it was last week. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what the executive order does is two things. It talks about the immediate actions that the state agencies were uh, directed to start in January of this year, uh, whether that was reprioritizing resources or starting new programs. It does. The second thing it does is it creates a task force uh, that will be co-chaired by Stephanie Soline, the vice chair of the Puget Sound Partnership Leadership Council, I believe to my left here, and Dr. Les Purse, the former president of the Evergreen State College. Uh, task force members will require all of our partners, our tribal partners, our federal partners, our state agencies, uh, stakeholders, uh, impacted communities, local governments, other governments, uh, other, other states, and uh, Canada. So those are a few of the task force members. Uh, we will also have work groups that uh, work on the identified threats to the southern residents, the prey availability, uh, vessel noise and traffic, 
and toxics and contamination. A report is due back to the governor on November 1st of this year that will be built into budget and policy development by myself and Jim Cahill, my um, budget counterpart. The second year of the task force will continue the work, uh, identifying the gaps, looking at progress, monitoring, and pushing new legislation forward into the next year. So Habitat. We are uh, prepared to respond to a number of questions and concerns around Habitat. Habitat is important to create different outcomes, not only for the orca, but for salmon and for people. We must be more effective in protecting what we have. We must expand our network by educating the broader public. When the public understands why these things are important to them, they will engage, they will invest, and then they will own. And once you own something, you are willing to push on your elected leaders to have legislation that benefits what you are interested in. We will increase coordination, synergy, and tracking of our regulatory programs, and then address more specific habitat needs. We will get the appropriate state agencies that work on riparian together and just discuss how to create more synergy and action to protect and restore riparian. And then we will sit down with the tribes, if they will have us, and discuss um, how we can best implement these actions. Uh, current land use laws have a no net, net, no net loss standard. We would like to see that move in a different direction. We would like to see net ecological gain. That would be a huge change in law. Likelihood of a change in law may be challenging, but we are up for those challenges if we absolutely stand united, consistently message, and draw the public together around these important issues. Stormwater retrofits for older development requirement for low impact development, which reduces soil and vegetation disturbance and impervious surfaces. Floodplains must be restored where possible. Estuaries, which are critical to recovery. And forage fish, we must continue to protect and restore marine shoreline habitat to build robust fish populations. So the governor is also interested and has directed me to look at the predator issues. These can be challenging for our public. Once our public is educated and brought in with these shared values and interests, they may be able to support us through what could possibly be challenging legislation. The governor wrote a, a joint letter uh, regarding uh, more flexibility in the Marine Mammal Protection Act and also wrote a letter regarding looking at flexibility around spill over dams. So this governor and this administration hasn't been afraid of uh, challenging issues of political pushback and there are many successes. One thing I did hear uh, Billy Frank Jr. talk about was that our successes inspire and can drive the next steps. So what are those successes? We have uh, new Fish and Wildlife Commissioners who are big, broad thinkers. We have three, three uh, folks that are coming up in 2018, which will possibly have new openings. Please give some thought to that. Bring me your ideas. We have partnerships at the Department of Fish and Wildlife that haven't always been there. We have an organically grown partnership with, between Habitat and the FISH program. Um, we have North of Falcon involvement. As I said earlier, the governor's office has been involved to make sure that the, those negotiations are successful for all. We will continue to work with agriculture. We, will, we are considering a natural resources sub-cabinet that will work on one to two issues every month. We're looking at how a united Habitat strategy would work how we can create together a focused effort that focuses on priority issues, that uses resources efficiently and enables us all to read off the same page. We want state citizens um, and partners, partners to act together and reasonably. And we think we can do that. 
In conclusion, the governor, this administration, myself, we're not satisfied with the status quo. We are here and we are at the table and we want to bring voices of all interests to that table. But I'm here also to say something that you already know, that we cannot do this alone. We absolutely must do this together. We can inspire change, looking at our successes and our failures. We can show people why it's important to support, invest, and engage in our natural resources, which is our very essence, which is the very essence of our quality of life. We are supportive of the work groups that um, I heard about last night of Tribal State Habitat Retreat to promote collaboration. But we must move from an ecosystem to ecosystem and bring the broader community along. We have such leadership in this room and I'm urging you to take that leadership, the innovation, and the commitment that we all have by showing up today. And as we leave this room, take it with us, the follow-up and the accountability. Hold me accountable, hold each other accountable. I will go back to the governor and I will talk about what I learned today. And I am inspired and I'm ignited and the, um, I will say in the last piece is that who ignites me most, it's my son. My son who is concerned about what nature will look like when he has his planned four children and live in the woods. So um, that's one of the things that drives me when I'm tired, I'm weary, I'm frustrated, and I'm afraid to show up at work and continue doing what I do. I'm so very grateful to having um, been invited. Justin, thank you so much for allowing me to try to put something together. And um, I appreciate all of you. Thank you. So that concludes this panel. I know we tried making up some time here. <laughs> A um, little bit of a wrap up before I kick it over to Glenn. Uh, thank you, JT, and the rest of the panel for your, your words. I know there's been a, a lot of mention, not a lot has changed, and I've heard that you know mentioned a couple different times throughout throughout the day. Um, understanding our you know our history, where we where we came from, why things happened the way they happened, how we how we how tribes made a play, how we you know put our treaty rights on the line in a number of different cases to advance you know, various efforts, whether it be salmon recovery or whether it be for, from the harvest aspect, et cetera, or, or to restore, you know, with, with our uh, culvert case now. And the tribes don't take that easily. In fact, it's a, a very difficult thing. And, and sometimes you got to be careful about throwing tribes treaty rights out there. It's, it's not something that's taken lightly. Um, been spanked on that before. Um, but, uh, you know, again, on this panel, I've heard a number of things of, you know, you got to learn from your mistakes. So if you keep making the same mistake over and over, you know, obviously something's wrong there. And you probably need to get out of the game. But if you learn from those mistakes, you move on, you move on in the correct way and then fix things going forward. And so I think that's a lot of what we have to do. Tribes are place-based um, communities. And, and so it, the, the, the resources we depend on upon them, our cultures are con and traditions are based largely on our, on our resources. Anytime we have a potlatch or, or my sister, she mentioned a, a funeral that's going on back home in Nia Bay, um, a lot of what we prepare the table with is, is seafood. And so, you know, when we have tribes that, you know, here you hear Sean Chairman Yannity's story from Stillaguamish. Uh, it's been over 30 years since he's had a fishery and in his river. And it, it, it's really sad shape of condition that our, our watersheds are in. Um, you know, we, we have some spikes where we, we see some harvest numbers that have, have gone up just not too recently with the, the sockeye, Fraser River sockeye, about what has it been, six years ago, whatever that time frame was, seven years ago. But just as quickly as that had that historic record, we've had just, they just tanked. And so our, our species, and we, I know we have a number of our First Nations that are here. Um, so the, the issues that they're dealing with up in, up in Canada affect all of us, you know, the Malpoly issue. Um, all the various different things that go around from the state of Alaska to Canada along the west coast here on in our region. Um, and so I think that the biggest takeaway that, that I would have after hearing all these different panels 
Um, you, you know, you had the, the legal, the history, understanding where you come from. Um, how, how do we how do we move forward from the science standpoint? You're bringing the technical aspect. I can't imagine just thinking what Billy went through in during his lifetime. Now, in that montage, he said he's going to be living to be another 50 years. We always believed that. You know, I, I always figured I had another good 20 years with Billy. Um, and, and, and I think we all did, you know, and we just, you know, we just can't control. Some things are out of our control, but there's a lot of things that we can control. And I think what, what we can control is the start of the igniting part of it and call into action. The, the folks, it's unfortunate that the, the kids, I know they, they got, you know, you got school and field trip issues and you got to get them back by a certain time. So I wish, I really wish the students were able to here, this segue from the science standpoint to the, the, the public policy standpoint, you have people in the, you know, that are in, uh, with um, uh, uh, Paulette Jordan, who is in the legislature, as well as uh, Senator McCoy, that's in, the, in our Washington state legislature. Um, you have Dennis from being a political appointee in the, in the federal system, part of the Obama administration, JT, uh, as well in the executive branch in the, in the state government. And how some of those successes that they've had how there's been some failures is as well but how do you move forward um, how can we advance some of these issues to, to really move forward and make some positive impact it's, it's the state and the federal government are definitely tough nuts to crack when it comes to that federal and state bureaucracy there's no question about it you got the executive branch you got the legislative branch you got the judicial branch um, so very very tough and we as tribes, we use that on every recourse that we can, where we can really advance things. You know, whether it be now, unfortunately, we're not the ones that are appealing uh, the decision of the Supreme Court on the Culver case. You know, but we're going the judicial route, so we're there. So now we have to deal with it. We're going to do what we what we can to win. A legislative standpoint, there's been some successes in the state legislature. Um, the leadership of our Commissioner of Public Lands in, in helping move forward and, and making it easier for the the banning of the net pens, line examine net pens, another victory, you know. Unfortunately, we had the Hearst decision, the, the decision that overturned Hearst, I should say. Um, but there's been some successes, but there's an urgency. And I hope that urgency really resonates with folks here today that are, that are still left. I really thank those of you that stayed behind and, and finished out this day because our urgency is now. We're, our, our guys are on a halibut call right now with the federal government, so we've got some big issues with the federal government. You know, we got such a broad sector of folks here from tribal state government. We have staffers from the congressional standpoint. We have enhancement groups. We have uh, 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 forest uh, uh, and ag folks here in the business industry. So really appreciate the turnout. And ultimately, at the end of the day, it's how can we get this done? You know, it's easy to throw in a towel. It's easy to get frustrated. I get frustrated. Um, Dennis has heard my frustration over time on, on our treaty rights at risk and advancing those issues. JT, she's heard my concerns and frustration on, on our different short lists that we've put together in various the different meetings that we've been in. Um, but at the end of the day, I hope what, what comes out of this is that everybody here can make that commitment and to move forward and to make something happen. Um, thank you. I don't think I ever get frustrated, and I think Dennis can attest to that. <laughs> I think he's heard it once or twice. I want to thank our panel for sitting up here, being with us all day as well, and uh, taking part here and sharing um, what you've learned and what you know, your knowledge along the way here on this journey. Thank each and every one for still being with us here this afternoon. I know it's been long and um, remind you that we still have dinner at six o'clock tonight. Uh, we will have witnesses that are going to speak and on the schedule they were going to speak now but we're going to adjust a little bit and we're going to do the call to action. And we handed out this this paper here and asked that you might review it a little bit and give it give it some thought. 
And um, we could walk through this whole thing. And people, our staff, have put a lot of work into this. But the reality is we know what needs to be done. We've said it over and over again. We know the issues that are out there. We know the tasks that need to be done. We know that we need legislative people to, be, to make right decisions to support the actions that need to take place. And the story that Bill was sharing, the story of we, the story of forming a coalition of people to get these things done. And I don't think we use that coalition opportunity enough. Sometimes we get comfortable in just sitting in our position and not working with other groups. We're just going to keep our position moving forward. We need to find a way to work together. We need to find a way to bring our message out. In doing so, we help educate. In doing so, whether we like it or not, we also understand the issues that some of the other users are facing. And working together, we find solutions of how to manage through those. How to come together to make decisions that help all of us while still protect our treaty right, understand our sovereignty, while still bringing forward a viable future for our salmon, for our environment, for our children. We have this whiteboard over here with the design on it. Harvester with a net. And we ask that you step forward if you're committed to working together in a coalition aspect or just under the word we. We are going to do this together. And when we say we, it's not just tribes. It's everyone that's taken part here today. Everyone that is impacting this resource. I ask you to step forward and sign and make a commitment that you're willing, when called upon, to step forward and do what you need to do. That a working group will come forward and meet on a regular basis to put together ideas, promote solutions, promote ways to come to a conclusion on issues. There's a lot of time that we spend fighting. There's a lot of time that we spend lobbying. There's a lot of time that we spend arguing our points. There's a lot of time that we save if we do it together. We do it as one voice, bringing this, bringing this around to a feasible outcome. We've heard many great speakers. We've had many great speakers, many great leaders. But again, I go back to Billy. And he found ways to put 50 arrests, years and years of fighting to exercise his treating right, being put in jail, being beaten. He put it aside to figure out a way to come together and work together. And that was his message, to come together. And when we say that, that's the, that's the tribe, that's the state, that's the industry, that's the public. We need to bring whatever, whatever user groups together to form these coalitions to bring the message. We as tribe know that our greatest, our greatest voice is when we stand together and we speak in unity. When we do that, things happen. We, we get actions to take place. We get legislation passed. Why would it not be different if we, as the collective users, the collective ones having the impact on the resource, speak together as one voice to save it? One voice. That's all we're asking. That commitment. And it isn't going to change overnight. And it isn't going to just be magic. Billy didn't believe in magic. It takes work. It takes commitment. So we ask, well, our... Speakers are we're going to ask our speakers to witnesses come up and speak, but anytime stand up 
Place your name on that mat and dedicate your time. And it is a dedication of time. I hold no public office. I have no job. I spend all day here today to speak with you about something that I believe in as well. I have three grandkids, one on the way. I want them to exercise what I have always been able to exercise. I want them to teach their children to exercise what I have always been able to exercise. We need that for everyone. So I ask you again, feel free anytime. Step forward, sign your name, be committed. Put your pencil where your thoughts are. Make that commitment, make that statement. Don't make it just because it's a feel good thing to do. Make it if you're committed, because we're gonna call upon you. We're gonna form that coalition. We're gonna make this happen. We're not going to make it happen for Billy. We're going to make it happen for the next generations. So they have something. Joseph. All right. Thank you. I would just like to thank everybody one more time and, and make a few acknowledgments. Uh, it kind of slipped me. I'd like to acknowledge my daughter, Leilani, and my son, Jason, for being here. Jason was with me when he was six years old at a, at a, at a FERC hearing in Washington, D.C., and everybody complimented how well-behaved he was. My daughter was a, late, was a baby when we celebrated uh, the Forest and Fish celebration. Remember that, Bill? Um, and she was there, and uh, she received a lot of compliments, too. And I think it's, you know, just a reminder of what we're all here for, our children and our generations, and... Uh, you know, all seven of my children were with me when I signed the agreement with the uh, uh, city of Tacoma. And, uh, and, uh, and I'd like to thank and praise all the women out there, too. My mother was a great mentor of mine. She, she started taking me to meetings when I was like 13, 14 years old. Well, I was, I was laid up for the summer with a broken leg. And you know, so I was kind of a captive audience. And I learned how to can and make jam. And, uh, but I continued out through high school. She would drag me to the, to the meetings. And, and I learned under her, I learned under, you know, we've heard any number of names that I consider mentors. And, and I've listened from some of the greatest leaders and some of the wisest people and, and learned from them. Uh, one name I haven't heard mentioned today is Norm Dix. I like to put it, Give a big sh shout out to Norm Dix, and uh, I'd like to thank Bill and Mike Graham, and uh, you know, and, and, and there's so many others out there. We've we've, we've been we've, we're all so blessed to have so many people so committed. Thank you.